This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. Good evening. Um, this uh, we are now beginning our meeting for October fifth, two thousand twenty. Governor Baker's March 12th order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law allows us to hold this virtual town meeting. I will call each counselor by name, although I will recognize we're still waiting for a few to be connected. And they should unmute and say they're present and that we can hear them and they can hear us. Um, please remember to mute your mic when you go back. Um, raise hand function. Um, given that we have a quorum of the council present, I am calling the October 5th, 20 meeting of the Amherst Town Council to order at oh, like, um, Let me the same rare rank. Oh, I've got the too same much to level up. Somebody yeah. needs to mute, please. I need to mute. Okay. Thank you. Um, so uh, let's begin. <laughs> Uh, Shalini Bowmill, not yet. Uh, Alyssa Brewer? Present. Pat DeAngelis? Present. Darcy DeMont? Present. Um, Lynn Griesmer is present. Mandy Jo Haneke? Present. Dorothy Pam? Working on that connection. Evan Ross? Present. George Ryan? Present. Kathy Shane. Present. Steve Schreiber. Present. Andy Steinberg. Present. Sarah Schwartz. Present. And Shalini Balmilne is present. Thank you. And so we are going, this meeting is being recorded. It is also going to be available afterwards. And um, it is available by audio, video, and live on Amherst Media. If you would like to connect, you can either connect through this or you can connect by calling in. And if you're calling in and you want to ask a question during public comment, I mean, make a comment during public comment, please use the raised hand function. We have two, we have three very brief announcements. Um, and these are related to, and Serge, are you with us? Don't think so. Uh, He's helping Dorothy. Thank you. There he goes. Uh, we just want to make sure you're aware that there is a COVID hotline and also a website. We want to make sure that you're aware that Community Preservation Act proposals are due on October 12th, which is coming right up, and also that the emergency rental assistance funding has mm. a round of funds available, and you can apply for those by going to uh, community action, and you can find that information on the website. So given that, we are going to now go on to the rest of the agenda. And our first area is public comment. And so we're going to take that down, Serge, to later. Thanks. Okay, for public comment, uh, at the moment, I only see one hand, Allison, uh, please raise your hand, okay? We're going to bring you into the room. Please unmute, state your name and where you live. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, I am Allison uh, McDonald. I can see that I'm actually Allison Blyler on your screen, but I say I am Allison McDonald. I live in Amherst. Um, I am... Uh, first, I wanna, first off, I want to thank you all for all the dedication and intense work that you all have been doing all summer long um, for our community. Um, I'm here this evening to speak about this recent surge in COVID-19 cases in our community and to ask about the actions the town will take to address this and help slow and stop wider community spread of this virus. Our current case count as of this morning on the website, on the town website was 78, most of all of which were new since Wednesday of last week. The timing is important since the governor updates the categorization of communities in its color-coded map on Wednesdays of each week, and communities that are not designated as red zone 
may advance further in the governor's phase reopening plans as of today. While Amherst was designated yellow last Wednesday, the search, search system puts us squarely in the red, suggesting that further business reopening beginning today would be unwise. Indeed, our schools will remain closed to in-person learning for two more weeks due to the local surge in new COVID-19 cases. Given this, I urge you to consider the following. Uh, one, consider a halt to further reopening of businesses and services until Amherst is no longer in the red zone for two consecutive weeks. Consider also taking steps beyond what the governor's guidance suggests that can help bring the virus back under control in our community, such as perhaps moving back in the state phasing plan and implementing restrictions on indoor dining and bar service. To begin stricter enforcement of our current mask order and mandate. We have a mandate in pl place for the downtown area that includes stiff penalties for non-compliance. But initially this policy has mostly been about education and the likelihood of any penalties was expected to be small. With local new cases putting us in the red zone, now is the time to begin strict enforcement of that policy. Consider also taking action against gatherings, outdoors and indoors, that exceed the size limits included in the town and state orders. Providing a COVID hotline for the community to call in concerns is great, but if nothing is happening in the moment to break up such gatherings, it's hardly helping limit the spread of the virus. Take action to respond to complaints and break up gatherings when they are happening. These are all actions the town could be taking now to enforce compliance with its own current policies and orders, independent of whatever actions that UMass may be taking with its students. We've done really well until recently with maintaining control to the point that we were about to reopen our schools for face-to-face -face learning for our most vulnerable and high needs students. Please consider and prioritize their needs and help us do more to bring this virus back under control in our community. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Allison. Um, Brian Yellen, please enter the room, unmute, and uh, state your name and where you live. Hello, my name is Brian Yellen. I live at 13 Norwatuck Circle in South Amherst. And I just wanted to voice my support for uh, the wage theft bylaw. Um, I'm not sure if there's an agenda item on it, on it today. I didn't see it on the agenda, um, so I'm offering comment now. Um, the, the way the bylaw is written, it, it, it's easy to comply with for um, upstanding companies and it makes sense for our town. Okay, thank you, Brian. And Meg Robertson, please unmute, state your name and where you live. Hi, I'm Meg Robertson. I live at 560 Station Road in Amherst, Massachusetts. Uh, I'm also calling in tonight in support of the wage theft ordinance and um, really appreciate you taking it up and considering it in the town. I think that it would do much to strengthen uh, the impact of construction projects, the employment offered by our restaurants in our town, if there were assurance about um, wages being paid as they should be by not only the primary employers, but the subcontractors and sometimes the subcontractors of the subcontractors. That seems to be where uh, most of the abuses happen throughout the state of Massachusetts. Um, so just having been in this town now over 11 years, I really think it would make our community much stronger to have this ordinance on the books. And I really appreciate all of your time and attention to the issue. Okay. Are there any other people with public comment at this time? Just as a matter of information, the wage theft bylaw we hope will be on the agenda on October 19th. Um, and I want to make sure that Dorothy Pam, who has now joined us, can hear us. So please unmute and confirm that, Dorothy. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we are going to go on to the consent agenda, and I've asked that it be put up on the screen because it's a fairly lengthy consent agenda. Um, the following items were selected because they were considered to be routine and it was reasonable to expect they would pass with no controversy. To remove an item from the consent agenda for discussion later in the meeting, ask that it be removed when I list the consent agenda items. The request to remove an item from the consent agenda does not require a second. 
So what you'll do is raise your hand and I'll check all hands before we go. So the motion is to move the following items and the printed motions thereunder and approve those items as a single unit. The first is to suspend suspension of town council rules of procedure 8.4 for the following agenda items. 8D, the ranked choice voting commission charge and 8E, participatory budgeting commission charge. Waiver of the Town Council Rules of Procedure 8.6 for the following agenda item. And that is the item related to, it's actually item 14, and it is the item related to the hold harmless resolution, which we'll be dealing with next. Um, and all this does is allow us to uh, act on it tonight. Uh, on 9A5, we're still waiving of Town Council Rules of Procedure 8.6 for the extension of appointments for, to the Ranked Choice Voting Commission and 9A6, extension of appointments for the Participatory Budgeting Commission. 8D is approval of charges for the ch changes to Ranked Choice Voting Commission charge. And 8E is approval of charges to Participatory Budgeting Commission charges. Those are both extending their dates. 9A, one to four is approval of the town manager appointments to the following boards and committees, Affordable Housing Trust, Board of Trustees, Community Preservation Act Committee, Disability Access Advisory Committee, LSSE Commission. 9A5 is approval of extension of terms to Ranked Choice Voting Commission. 9A6 is approval of extension of terms to Participatory Budgeting Commission. And 11 A to B is approval of minutes, September 15, 2020, Joint Town Council and Community Resources Committee meeting minutes, and September 20th, 2020, Town Council meeting minutes. Just let me make sure I can see if there's any raised hands. Yes, uh, Darcy Dumont. Please unmute, Darcy. Um, uh, I was. I would just like it if you could explain to the viewing public rules of procedure eight point four and eight point six because I think it's pretty confusing to people okay. what we're doing right now. <laughs> Uh, you know, I had to spend some time figuring it out myself. Um, so um, would you be able to do that, Lynn? I will do that. And if I can't, I'll ask for some assistance. Um, is there a second to the motion? Ryan, George, second. Ryan, George Ryan is seconded. So. Um, let me just explain. Town Council Rules of Procedure 8.4, by suspending that rule, it allows us to vote tonight instead of having this to come back for a second uh, time on the agenda. So it literally means we do not have to have it on the agenda twice. And if we suspend that rule, we can go ahead and act on it tonight. The waiver of Town Council Rules of Procedure 8.6 is a waiver that means we are not referring these items to um, the to respective committees. In this case, we would have referred the um, a resolution to GOL, and we would have referred the extension of the appointments for ranked choice voting and appointments for participatory budgeting to TSO. And because they're pretty routine, both of these committees are already up and running. And basically because of COVID, they need an extension on their time frame, And they are committees that will be reporting within the next 12 months. In fact, one will report by the end of December, the other by next June. And when they do report, then those committees will be dissolved. Okay. Are there any other questions, counselors? And Darcy, did that hit the? Yeah, no, that 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 hopefully um, clarified it for 
Thanks. listeners. Yes, Kathy Shane, questions. Uh, yeah, mine is a, a question. Um, I think this is just a technical question on the participatory budget commission. It's extending it to a particular date and extending all the members on the commission to that date, but it also has the word two years in it. And we are not going to be meeting for two years. Um, even if we hadn't extended it, we didn't even start until September of 2019. So I just when there's a conflict, it, I certainly don't think we want to meet from two years from from starting now. So would it the date would override the two years in the way it's worded? That's correct. Okay. Are there any other questions at this time? Okay, this requires a roll call vote. Uh, and you can, Serge, you can take the screen down. And I'll start with Shelley Balmain. Yes. Alyssa Brewer. Yes. Patty Angelis. Yes. Darcy Dumont. Yes. Lynn Griesmer is a yes. Mandy Johanneke. Yes. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Evan Ross. Yes. George Ryan. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Steve Schreiber. Aye. Andy Steinberg. Yes. And Sarah Schwartz. Yes. We got consent agenda passes 13 4, none against, none abstentions, and no people absent. So we are going to now go on to a res the resolution. And um, since and let me just give a little background. This resolution is, we're the first body that's going to act on it. It is then going to go to the Amherst School Committee, the Amherst Pelham School Committee, and the Pelham School Committee. Um, and the resolution is arose because of a proposal that is being discussed at the State House that would eliminate the hold harmless clause in school funding for chapter 70. And since we developed this very rapidly over the weekend, I wanna thank Peter Demling and other people as well. The one we're going to show you on the screen actually has feedback that was received since the original one was posted. And so the first change in this is to split the first paragraph into two and add the word some. And then also, instead of just say, basically state aid, it says chapter 78, because there are other forms of state aid that this does not impact. In the second, what was the second and is now the third, whereas, there was basically a suggestion for rewording to make it more clear. I'm gonna give you a moment to look at those. Okay, and then if we could go on to scroll down, I believe there's one more change. Uh, yes, it, it, this very last bullet under the fourth whereas major, it's a, it's just a way in which it's formatted. So it has to be changed to format it correctly. And then was there any, were there any others? I'm just looking at my draft. Yes, at the very end, it is to say losing hold harmless would have a profound negative impact on the quality of ec and equity of our public schools. Hold harmless aid is essential and equitable. Okay, so I hope I captured people's recommended changes. With that, I'm going to make a motion to approve the resolution, re resolution as amended. Is there a second? 
Second, Steinberg. Thank you, Andy. Okay, questions, George Ryan. Just a very small one about an adverb. Uh, this is my GOL personality creeping into the fore. In the very first, whereas, it says some advocacy groups seeking to implement the act quickly. I guess that's what it means. In other words, this, these groups want to do this quickly, and that's why we need to, why this, or one of the reasons for this resolution. That is correct. As opposed to just saying that they are proposing to eliminate. That's which correct. Would be my instinct, but okay. This is why we're working, we're doing this instead of referring it to GOL. Uh, Mandy Jo Haneke. Yeah, um, the, the second page where you added the hold harmless in all caps, it's now a repeat. So I think just Scrivener wise, cause it's, it's down at the bottom. I don't know how we wanna show it, but it's now just repeated. Thank you. I will get rid of it. Thanks. This is part of doing these things very rapidly and I apologize for that. Dorothy, questions, comments? I could not rephrase that to explain what it's about to someone. Um, and um, so I'm gonna ask a couple of questions. We have had hold harmless for a long time in our public school. I think that means you don't reduce the amount of funding. Is that correct or not? Sean Mangano is here and he is prepared to explain this, if yeah. that would be helpful. Sean, why don't you go ahead? That's a big task. I don't know if I'm <laughs> to explain all of it, but um, so chapter 70 is just a very complicated formula. It always has been. It's, it's very difficult to explain, um, which is, just, is one of the issues. Uh, but yeah, we've had hold harmless. It essentially means that if the chapter 70 formula, which has a number of um, economic variables and enrollment based variables, if the formula would say that we should get less chapter 70, Mm -hmm. And the hold harmless provision would keep us flat and we would carry that forward. And so the biggest thing for Amherst is that over the last 10 or 15 years, our enrollment has dropped, you know, mm -hmm. somewhere between 15 and 30%. And so the hold harmless provision has kept us flat while we've seen some of those enrollment drops. Um, and there's been some other changes as well in the formula, but that's one of the bigger ones. So then the next question is why, who wants to change it? It sounds like it was connected to some other good program. I mean, we have this program, we've had it. Who wants to change it? Why do we have to reassert it? So I please go ahead. I can't speak to all the motives, um, but I think this gets back to a little bit about uh, George's question about the quickly. Um, the Student Opportunity Act calls for a lot of um, increased investment in, in the Chapter 70 program and in schools and the plan to implement that program was gonna take many years with sort of small increases each year to fully implement. And I think the group, which is a, a Boston based group um, is saying, well, we could implement that Student Opportunity Act more quickly if we got rid of the whole harmless provision that would free up some money and we could implement it faster. Um, so that I think that's sort of part of their rationale for why they're that's, that's helpful. That. Okay, thank you. Are there further questions, Dorothy? Um, no, I, I just needed to know who wanted to change it and why we were considering it, because obviously you want to keep hold harmless. Right. Thank you. Alyssa, you have your hand up. Thank you. Just a couple of bits associated with this. Um, and because of other reasons, I would have received the report that perhaps not everyone received, even though I'm pretty sure we also got notice from our local senator and our state rep mentioning the specific report that we're referring to in this resolution as some advocacy groups rather than calling them out by name. But if you look at that report, it is just as Sean said, and while one reading that report who's never served on a school committee or been involved in town finance might say, well, yeah, that makes sense. The poorest communities need the most money, of course. That seems socially just and appropriate. But what it does not take into account is a couple of things. One is that we don't have another way of making up this money. I know it's already been in the press that we're talking about $8 million a year at this, you know, at this particular juncture. We don't have a way of saying, well, that's fine. We'll just ask the taxpayers for more money. That means we would have to make those cuts to our school. So 
the report implies that all the communities that are getting this hold harmless aid can just make up for it someplace else. And that's just completely false. So that's one reason why we have to reassert this. Another thing I just wanna make sure I mention is, as many of you know, I serve on the MMA Fiscal Policy Committee. And when the Student Opportunity Act was being discussed before it actually passed, there were definitely people there who said, why am I gonna tell my reps to vote and my senators to vote for this? This isn't gonna help my community. Why am I gonna do it? It's, going to help some other communities, not going to help me, which is, of course, not the kind of thing we like to imagine our fellow municipal officials would do, but it is the reality. And the way they were able to convince their constituents that it was okay is that they had the help hold harmless provision in there. And so you take away hold harmless, the whole thing would never have passed because there are too many communities that can cannot, that yes, there are some wealthy communities out there who could probably find a way to make up for some of the money we aren't one of those communities for sure. We're not gonna be able to make that up. And so if you also read that report a little carefully, it also really dives into the idea of, well, you know, there are these rural schools and they have very little enrollment. So they're just gonna have to deal with that. I'm not sure if they think putting kids on a bus for longer than an hour every day, like they are in some communities already is somehow a good idea. But while the reports imply that they're about social justice and fairness and equity, that's not actually true. And so that's why it's important for us to go ahead and assert this now. The other thing I just wanted to ask about is if we weren't writing this particular document, we were advised by by, uh, Senator Comerford and by Mindy Dom, our representative, that there is this opportunity to write in in response to a survey from DLS, DLSDOR slash DESI, and that's by October 16th. So are we planning or are the schools planning to write something additional for that October 16th? Are there any particular talking points that the schools are looking forward to us making, you know, doing that in addition to this? Because if there wasn't a survey, right, this would be a letter we would write. There is also a survey, and so obviously we can attach this and send it in as part of the electronic survey, but I'm just wondering, as this unfolds, and just we have a very short time period here, if there's anything else in addition to this that our schools would appreciate having the municipal side go ahead and comment on the survey. I'm pretty sure Paul and Sean and Mike are already working on something, perhaps, in addition to this particular thing. Uh, Paul or Sean, um, you might want to assist me with the answer. I believe the plan is to put this in as our answer. But Sean? Or yeah, Paul? the plan was to, so, so we can look at the survey and, and if there's specific fields, we can try to, you know, answer those specifically. But I think the plan was to attach um, this resolution, which we developed in, in conjunction with the schools. Um, and there may be more technical arguments that we want to include in that as well. Um, we'll have to see sort of what specific areas they're asking for. Okay. Listen, thank you. Uh, Kathy. Um, I just had a question. I, I have no question on doing this resolution, but how many cities and towns are affected by the loss of Hold Harmless? And if we put out a press release or something, are we one of, you know, name, a large group, you know, so it's not just one town being affected. So the way it's written, it's very much logically, it's just Amherst, the way we've written it. But um, putting out something that says we're among blah, 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 of, you know, they account for so many thousands of students, it just seems to me it makes it stronger that we're not alone. Sean, go ahead. So I looked at it, um, I think as of FY20, and, and it's something like 62 or 63% of the districts um, receive hold harmless aid of some, you know, of different magnitudes. It varies by community. Um, Boston, I think, is one of those communities, which obviously is very big and has a lot of a lot of students and would represent a huge portion of the, the student population in the state. So um, it's, a, it's a large population of the students in the state. Yeah, my, my point is just, you know, I... I in another walk of life, I thought about the report and then the press release. Not we probably not doing a press release, but if you say sixty-three percent of districts and uh, fifty thousand students would have a cut if this went through, it just it just pu- puts it in a, a much bigger context. It really hurts us, and it really hurts a lot of other places. So, 
Um, maybe that's more Mindy and Joe's role, but it, it's helpful to me to have that kind of information. Okay. All right. uh, Andy. Yes, um, several things that I just wanted to cover that have been talked about because I spent a lot of time working on this uh, uh, in, to help also with the drafting. Uh, first of all, I want to remind the council that the Student Opportunity Act was uh, passed by the legislature earlier this year to try and change the formula to um, largely make it a more equitable formula for um, districts. We were not a beneficiary of that, but this council and our school committee both passed resolutions in support of the Student Opportunity Act, knowing, <clears throat> excuse me, knowing that um, because it was the right thing to do. And I think one of the things that we need to uh, be very clear about with everyone is, uh, and it is in the resolution, that we did support it because it is the right thing to do, but we shouldn't be penalized by its implementation. The second thing is, as uh, Sean points out in his memo, um, the act actually requires that um, the Department of Revenue Division uh, of Local Services and uh, DESE um, obtain comments um, on implementation issues. And so this October deadline that Lisa was referring to is really about comments. And when you look at the DESE website, which I did over the weekend, um, it is, um, not really a survey as much as it is a mechanism for submitting comments. And so most of it um, is a comment box and the ability to attach documents to the comment box. Um, so I think that that was the second point that um, I just really wanted to bring out. And I think the third reality is, is that uh, this came up so quickly um, and we had a lot of time constraints because of the schedule of council meetings and school committee meetings that we really had um, very little bit of time with a large number of people involving uh, uh, school committee and some counselors who were trying to put this together. Um, and there was sort of a desire to meet the deadline to allow action in the council and the school committee this week because it was the last opportunity to do it and to get it in by October 16. So, and there was a desire among some of the drafters to make sure that it was short. The, the original request was to keep it to a page on the ground so that nobody reads more than a page. Um, so that uh, there was, a, you know, it was a balancing act and um, of, of time in varying demands, uh, but that I thought it would be help, additional helpful information. So thank you. Andy, thank you for that information. And also thank you for all your work on helping clarify and get this done over the last Friday, over the weekend, et cetera. Are there any other questions from the council? Okay, so the motion has been made and seconded. Uh, it is to adopt the, uh, resolution as amended and seeing no other questions or hands raised, I'm going to start with Alyssa. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Yes. Darcy Dumont. Yes. Lynn Griesmer. Yes. Mandy Johanneke. Yes. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Evan Ross. Yes. George Ryan. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Steve Schreiber. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Sarah Schwartz. Yes. And Shalini Balmilm. Yes. And we will make sure that the record shows it was a unanimous vote. And I will make sure that we forward this uh, amended copy to the other boards that will be reviewing it. Okay. 
Uh, we're going to go on to our presentations and discussions. Uh, at this point, we're going to go to the COVID-19 update and the town manager is being joined by uh, acting health director, Jen Brown. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, there, there's Jen. <laughs> Sometimes you look at the screen and you don't see everything. So um, we have a slightly updated um, uh, um, slide deck. So I'm not sure if there, if that's up and running yet. Um, Serge has it ready to go and I'm, I'm posting it online now. Okay, thank you. Ready to go, yep. Good, thank you. So um, this has been a big couple weeks for us and I appreciate, that's why I really recognize um, that we're so fortunate as a town to have Jen here working so hard. She's working seven days a week, um, really knows her numbers and is very confident and and digging into Maven and really appreciate that. Um, so, um, so I go to the next slide. So, oh, this is the slide. Welcome, Jennifer. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the snapshot we show every time. So um, the um, there's a typo on our website that had uh, when the key thing here is the second bullet where it says 75 current cases. That is accurate. Uh, the, there's a typo on our website that said 45. That's what we just corrected. And that's why there's an updated uh, slide deck that just went out. Uh, all the other numbers are accurate. So 75 current cases. And we're going to talk about how big that number is compared to the last time we presented, which was when I think we were talking about eight or nine cases when I talked to you back in September. So next slide. So this, we are a yellow community now. Um, that is an uptick for us. We, you know, we, you want to be in either the gray or the green territory. Uh, we are yellow. We do not want to be in red. Red um, indicates that you are, um, you cannot move forward under the governor's reopening plan. It also just tells you that you're not doing so well as a community. Um, these uh, colors, these um, numbers come out every Wednesday. So they, they will come out on October 7th, next time we see them. So next slide. So this just shows our neighbors and what the what the map looks like and what's happening in the state. And you know, there's usually a lot of these things. They're very um, incident specific things that are driving the changes. And what this looks at is that the last two weeks and how you're doing. Um, so um, we are doing. We're in the four to eight cases per hundred thousand, and we would like to be in the under four um, cases per hundred thousand. Next slide. We also like to look at what are what's happening at our, with our institutional partners, uh, the University of Massachusetts, which we'll talk a little bit about to, a, a fair amount tonight. About tonight, uh, they had 121 positive cases cumulatively. Amherst College has four cases cumulatively. This is from the beginning of their testing regimen. Hampshire College has ooh, there's a typo there too. Uh, there is zero cases um, so far. Go to the next slide. So this is the slide we want to spend some time on. We're going to look at the bottom graph first, and that's the total new cases. And you've all read about the increase in cases uh, due to a cluster, and that you can start to see that tick up on where it says on the bottom graph where it says September 24th. This graph shows you the number of cases per day that have been identified by the university. Um, and then you see, um, under October 1, that giant increase. And those are all cases that have come to light in terms of being tested uh, COVID positive. The chart above it is the number of tests that are performed. So if you look at that same time period, September 24th, you know, there's the, the university has been pretty regular. Those, those five bars when there is Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and then there's a drop on Saturday and Sunday, then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Um, so there was a, um, the testing on September, the week of September 24th, where it was about the same as previous. The next week, the week where it says October 1, a big uptick in testing. And one of the reasons for that is because of this, um, you know, this, the cluster that was identified and got a lot of coverage, also, the university sent out a um, email 
directing students to who lived off campus to come in and get tested. And I think the um, they had almost 3,000 or over 3,000 tests on mon that Monday after the email went out. Um, so, um, so a lot of things about this. So th this was very concerning to us as the test, and, and Jen will talk more about that. Um, and um, well, Jen, do you want to just talk about the cluster and what has happened with that? Yeah, is there an, um, another slide or I can just talk about that? So it yeah. started um, what Ann uh, Becker has reported to me and we've been discussing is that she gave me a call on Friday, uh, September 25th. She said, Jen, we have some cases coming in. So what she reported to us is there is a gathering identified and they're calling it a party. And that was actually September 18th. And what I understand, it was just eight, eight students. And from that, you can see what happened. The waves went out. Um, so, um, so here we are, uh, you know, two weeks later almost, and we have, uh, you know, 92 cases, you know, sort of has gone up and down since, since um, then. Or is that, is that correct with that number? But anyhow, you can see how the 80 went on 80, the third, and now cases are becoming to come come off. So, so one thing I can talk about, and you can stop me if this is not the right time, but when we identify a case, one of the things we do is we really look at that case, obviously do a needs assessment, see how they're doing, but we look back and see where they've been. So we really try to get a history of what perhaps we can find out where they got it from. So if we go backwards, we can identify something, then we can prevent other cases from branching off from that one person. But anyhow, so for us, it started, um, it's been climbing. These um, cases get entered via laboratory values and they get reported um, through, um, Anne uses a system called REDCap and then it goes into DPH and it comes to us, comes to Anne and me, um, something called MAVEN. I think you probably know it and I've talked about it, but the Massachusetts Virtual, Virtual Epidemiological Network. When cases come off, and we will see cases start coming off, those are done sort of manually, I want to say. Cases go in, you know, via laboratory, and then manually, one by one, we start taking people off. And if, if this is a good time, I can talk about isolation and when people come off isolation. Sure. Um, is that a good, okay? Yes, please. Uh, all right. So, um, Isolation is that period when you've been infected. So I heard this the other day, the I stands for infected in isolation. And typically we know now, even we have more data after six months, that time is 10 days. So it's 10 days if your symptoms have resolved, if you don't have a fever taking Tylenol. Um, so it's 10 days after your symptoms have started. And if you're asymptomatic, it's 10 days after a positive laboratory. Um, the PCR test will stay positive up to, um, it's about is it 90 days, it's three months. Um, so you don't test out, you really end isolation by symptoms. And then just quarantine is when someone has been exposed, they're a contact. Um, and I, I remember seeing photographs of you know, ships out in the harbor being quarantined for 40 days. They keep them out there, they're not allowed in, because that's the incubation period for this disease, it's, it's um, 14 days. So you wanna make sure no one becomes infectious in that time. Okay. You can go to the next slide. So we want to talk a little bit about what the university is doing. And I do want to credit the university because they have done a lot of good work in this area. Um, they have set up an asymptomatic testing facility at the Mullen Center, which is really one of the um, big and good ones, uh, great ones in the, in the country. And just, it, it, I think several people have toured through it. It's really terrific. Um, they have a very robust contact tracing. We do want to talk a little bit about what contact tracing is because that's really important and that's proving to be very important in this particular cluster in particular. Um, Jen talked about isolation and quarantine. 
how they're handling that. They, you know, as you know, that they have really focused on education and outreach and trying to educate students and reaching into the different communities, um, going door to door, in fact, they also asked me to let you know that they also have university administered discipline as required. Uh, they have had 195 cases handled in the month of September. I do not know the, the disposition of those cases. I just know that they have brought that many to the Dean of Students. Um, so and one of the reasons that, so I wanna talk a little bit about education and outreach, and then I'll turn to Jen to talk a little bit about what contact tracing means, because contact tracing is very important to understand. Uh, so on the education and outreach, um, they they really believe that if that it's through education, and I think we learned a lot of this from other diseases, uh, it's through education that you change attitudes, um, and that if you come down punitively on a lot of our uh, on students, which is what we're asked, a lot of people are calling us and saying, why aren't you hammering them, coming down very hard on students? What the net result of that is that students may become have um, become less um, interested in being tested. Um, if they are not tested, um, then we won't know um, if there's a case. We discovered this first case through asymptomatic uh, through an asymptomatic test, so that was a good early warning uh, um, sign for us. Um, and they also fear that people will not uh, participate in contact tracing because if you call up someone and say, were you at that party? They're, they're afraid they're gonna not tell them the truth or not answer the phone because they don't wanna get in trouble for having been at the party. Um, so I think that that's a philosophy that the university has. Other colleges and universities have taken a different philosophy where they have come down really hard on their students. Uh, one of the arguments the university makes in terms of keeping students engaged with the university is that if you um, suspend or expel a student, it doesn't mean that they leave the, the, the town. They still live where they're going to live. It's just that there's no more communication with that student. So their, their philosophy is that you engage the students and try to create uh, more and more of a culture of where people are watching out for each other. Um, contact tracing is so important. Jen, do you want to talk about what that is? You do a ton of that, I know, over the last years. Right? Yeah. So contact tracing is different for each um, communicable disease. For COVID, we really start with that person and we start going through um, when their symptoms started and then we go two days prior. So we sit and say, you know, what, where, where were you two days ago? Because we want to talk to you about who were you in um, contact with. And then we can go down a list and say, you know, did you eat with anybody? Um, you know, were you sharing kitchen space? Were you in the room? Um, and so you go through all the different scenarios. But one thing we really do want to focus on, and we're realizing, again, we have the data to support this, that it really takes 15 minutes and within six feet of being um, near that person for that period of time, or like a direct, you know, hit of a, a cough or a sneeze um, to transmit this disease. Um, so we'll go through the day, we'll go through the period where they're infectious, and then we reach out to those people. Um, and once we identify someone, we'll call them and we'll just say, hey, um, you have been exposed. Sometimes they know who the person is if it's small, but we really try to protect people and not give names if we don't need to. And I've done contact tracing with COVID saying, I'm not gonna be able to give you the name, but this is somebody that you were, um, you've been exposed and I just want you to know that. And then there's also really this human side to it. Obviously you're really building relationships with people. I think it was the New Yorker, maybe, um, I can't remember, but there's something about emotional intelligence that you're making a connection with somebody. You're really working with them. They're scared, they are sick sometimes. I mean, obviously it's many times, but I've called people, I'm like, hey, can I talk to you? And they've said, hey, I, I need to go, the nurse is coming in. It's like, oh, I didn't realize you were in the hospital, but we had this connection, we were able to talk. So there's this real human element to it. 
Hey, uh, next slide, please. So there's a, been a lot of confusion about the numbers that show up on the different websites. So I just want to be clear to help everybody understand what the university reports and what the town reports. They're two different things. So what the university reports are cases that they have identified through the university. Some of them, but not all of them, could live in the town. Um, but they could, and they could live in other towns. They may have someone who lives in Sunderland or Leverett or Holyoke or any place like that. So, but they report whatever they dis, uh, whatever they discover on their website. The town reports only the cases that are in the town of Amherst. And the basic um, counting mechanism that the state uses is by by city or town. So the cases that we report um, are from Maven. Um, and that's what gets put put on our website. All cases, both the town and the university, are working in Maven, which Jen mentioned is the Massachusetts Virtual Epidemi Epidemiologic Network, uh, which is created by the state. It's used for about a dozen other diseases as well as COVID-19, and so it's been in, in um, practice for quite some time. Um, so I just want to, uh, we're going to take a pause so you can, so we can answer questions, but I just wanted to mention that, you know, one of the things that when this um, cluster, you know, just grew very, very quickly on us, um, you know, we, one of the things that we did was reach out to the State Department of Public Health and said, you guys have dealt with this in other communities, we haven't, tell us what we should be doing you know, and we know what we know, we, we, but we don't know what we don't know. And so they were very responsive. Uh, Secretary of Health and Human Services, Mary Lou Sutter was on the phone with us along with the, their medical director, um, the assistant commissioner that deals with cities and towns. Um, and we've had the person who wrote Maven on, the, on a call with, with Jen. Um, they have really dedicated resources to us and since we had the secretary on the phone with, with me and Jen, uh, we had the superintendent of schools on the call as well, because this is very important to the schools, what has what is happening here. And he could convey his concerns and what was happening there. Um, we also brought up other issues that were, that involved the town um, that we we're also working on that we looking for support from this um, Department of Health and Human Services. So I think we'll pause there and see what this, this is a big issue, and I know that you want some time to talk and you listen to your constituents as well. Darcy Dumont has her hand up. Yeah, um, this is for Jen. Um, I just wanted to clarify what I thought I heard you say about, um, I think you said that um, you're finding that people can pick up COVID by being within six feet of each other for a period of 15 minutes. And I'm assuming you mean inside. And if that is what you said, that seems like it really has ramifications for indoor dining and schools. Yeah, so it's it's six feet, 15 minutes. And that's, you know, that's the number that they give and they don't differentiate between inside or outside. Um, there's a lot of work going into, um, you know, thinking about different filters and airflow, but really right now, the Department of Public Health, these are the numbers I use when I do contact tracing. Um, so when you talk about restaurants, um, you're talking about groups of people that are know each other and they're sitting together, um, but the, the tables, it's not even the tables, the next person to person needs to be um, that distance apart. Um, so, so that's what they've established. We, I don't believe, you know, I just think these, these big clusters that we see are happening in, in these tight gathering spots. Um, I don't know what the data is about restaurants. With schools, they're taking multiple and this applies for restaurants as well. It's multiple mitigation strategies and they're layered and they're concurrent. And when you use all these things together, um, the data, you know, this is what they say that the transmission, you've just lowered the risk. Did that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Oh, good, I'm glad. 
Kathy Shane. Yeah, I, um, Paul, you you showed the Amherst numbers and then you showed the UMass numbers, and so I'm wondering how much. I have a couple different questions. How much of the Amherst numbers are UMass? Um, these UMass clusters, as you know, you did a district one meeting and Tony put up a slide, which at that point had a cumulative UMass. This was September 22nd. They had 18 as of September 22nd. And the slide you just showed has 121. So that's the same surge you show with the bars. So, you know, I just wonder how much is that? And then the second is, um, the fear of people wouldn't come in to get tested or people wouldn't report contact. If part of the disciplinary action is large gatherings without masks, um, that's less related to testing or not. And why wouldn't, if some of the disciplinary action has gone after repeated large gatherings, if you put an email out to every student on campus that we mean don't do it, and this is what will happen, not with the person's name. It has a pre, to me, it has a preventive uh, impact. Maybe it's not a first strike. So I also don't know how many, and this is more, would be a UMass question, how much of the clusters, and I think there were two clusters they found that they weren't completely overlapping. So then they had to, at least that was one report I read. They didn't all come from just one, but maybe it just came from one. Um, but this notion is it mushrooms very quickly, and I believe most of them were living off campus. So we're up in North Amherst where we have a lot of uh, repeated, we were one of the hot spots on the UMass slide of repeated calls. You know, it's not just one time something's happening and fairly large groups. So I'm just questioning this, um, not do it, doing something more where the place you're going against the guidelines is large groups close together without masks. <laughs> yeah, so um, I'll, I'll let Jen talk about the number of cases that are UMass, out of the UMass. I think by far the large majority are you know, so in our town are associated with the university, um, a very large majority. Um, so in terms of, um, you know, I hear what you're saying, and I and we hear listen to a lot of folks about the why don't you crack down on the gatherings, and we um, continually talk about that. And uh, you know, when there's noise complaints, we do send officers. They do issue citations. They do educate, uh, even if they don't issue citations, they are educating about social distancing and the sort of expectations of the community. Um, we have talked about activating our uh, COVID ambassadors to. Um, be more uh, more in real time res responding to um, gatherings. Um, you know, the university and the um, town work very well together in terms of addressing the um, households that um, have repeated parties, and there are some, and we know where they are, and they go to them. And um, so, at at a certain point, you know, um, we may have to look at more. Um, uh, onerous uh, procedures on that, but um, right now we're we're working through, um, you know, th this this uh, this this cluster has been a a, a real um, lesson for us, and we're trying to figure out what's the next step. How do we prevent it from happening again? Um, and so we're in the town side. We're having active conversations about that. I, I know, you know, just to, to follow up, because, as you know, the kind of emails, because you're seeing the same emails we're getting, and it's a sense, this has real consequences for our town. Yeah. As Allison said, the schools aren't opening yeah. because of what's happening. And particularly to me, if it's warned once and then it happens again, you know, there, at some point you want to say, we were serious, something more would happen. Um, and uh, and the university has certain things it can do that are much, that are uh, the heavier club than us. We've got money. And I'm being asked, why just noise? Why not, if it's a large group without masks, go out, you know, go out and break it up, you know, because it, it's, and, and if, 
If the large group is formed and they're not making noise at four o'clock, they will make noise at eight o'clock, but can't we stop them at four o'clock before they get noisy? You know, it's sort of this, I can see the large group. And th so these are clearly outdoor parties is where a neighbor would be seeing them more. So it's this sense of particularly second time, you know, first time, oh, you just somehow weren't living in the neighborhood. You just didn't have the information. Second time you had the information. Yes, I hear you on that. Um, I don't have a, right, a good answer for you right now. Uh, let's go on to George Ryan. Paul, a number, as I'm sure you know, that a lot of people pay attention, pay attention to on our website is the, the total number of positive cases at any given time. And on Sunday, getting ready for my District 3 meeting, uh, it said the number was 80. Um, earlier today, when I checked, the number was 45. And now today, you tell us the actual number is 75. Yeah. Um, it's just, it's really an important number. I'm just wondering what, what, what happened. There's a typo in the, on the website, and that's the 45 should have been 75. So, and that was a mistake on our part. Okay, well, I understand. We all, trust me, we all make mistakes. It's just a really important number, at least from my perspective. And if you could just communicate to everybody that they really should be careful um, because it just creates confusion and potential mistrust um, when people look on that site. Um, and so anyway, that's, yeah, that's I know you know that. I'm just. I agree with you, yeah. Evan, you have a question? Yeah, I just, I wanted clarification about something that Jen said. Um, there was a statement that the cluster was linked to a gathering of eight students. That's eight students that tested positive in the gathering or eight students total in the gathering? Eight students total in the gathering. Um, that was the original party that night. Okay, so when we've been talking about parties, when we've been talking about, do we wanna set a lower gathering limit of 10 or 20, this cluster started with eight. Low. Okay, I think that's important information for us to consider. Thank you. Mandy Jo? That, that was going to be one of my questions, too, because I was going to ask about whether we needed to limit gatherings since we are going into phase two of phase three um, today because we aren't in the red yet. Um, but that answered my questions that it wouldn't would be really hard to do that. But I do have another question. My understanding from early on in this was that community spread is defined as not essentially not being able to contact trace people to another positive case and be able to sort of follow the links mm -hmm. um, and that there's not community spread if you can follow those links because you know then exactly where everyone contracted COVID from. So my question is for all of these 75 cases or particularly the ones related to coming from UMass, but really for all 75 in the town, are we at the point where we're at community spread now and so that the community at large needs to be concerned or are we still able to fully contact trace everyone who's coming in positive? So I spoke to Ann Becker about this and what she has told me is that, that the cases all but two are from UMass and have been linked to that first group. So it's this one cluster, but it's not defined as just sort of this tight um, group. It's, it, we're sort of generations out, and that's how Anne described it to me. But they've been related, um, um, a friend of a friend of a friend. And, and just to clarify, Ann Becker has sort of Jen's role for the university and is in charge of all the contact tracing in, for the university. Uh, Steve Schreiber. Yeah, actually, um, Councillor Ross asked my question, which is, that's an extraordinary low number. So eight is, I mean, is seems like a completely reasonable number. So that's what's a little bit, you know, surprising. And it actually kind of shows you how random this can be, right? So, but then, then I was just going to make the comment, and I sent the um, link to my fellow counselors about the New York Times. 
article about college campuses. And of course, there was a tale of two campuses in Amherst, one Amherst College, the other one UMass. And it ended with a line about the quarantine Amherst College student who lives in a dorm right next to a house or houses full of UMass students. And they yelled up from their beer pong game, you know, hey, come on over here. Well, we don't have rules or something like that. So, so that's, there we are. Alyssa. So I also want to give UMass credit for realizing that we were right about a number of things. So they originally didn't want to test off campus students and Paul talked to them and council talked to them and people in the community talked to them and they agreed that testing off campus students was actually a good thing and they really ramped that up and it is in fact a really wonderful model that people can look to across the country. And so I'm very proud of UMass for doing that. UMass also didn't have any interest in providing quarantine and isolation space for off campus students until we in the community said, you need to do that. Now, I'm sure they had other reasons for doing it because the history is UMass doesn't do anything just because we asked them to do it. But that is something that did happen associated with this. And so I, I'm very happy with those changes. I think you're hearing and you are going to continue to hear that we are unhappy with the educational approach because the educational approach is great for telling people why not to bring 12 packs of alcohol into a dorm room when there are going to be undergraduate students there. An educational approach is great for telling people to consider you know, sexually transmitted disease. It's great for talking about not using alcohol and then driving, but instead taking an Uber or a bus. The decisions that a very tiny number of people, the vast majority of people are being responsible. The decisions that a tiny number of people are making are not impacting just them. They are impacting the rest of the community, as we've heard tonight. They're impacting our ability to open our schools. Eight students made decisions that are impacting the ability to educate hundreds of school children. So when we hear, while it makes sense educationally, that you know these are still relatively young people, we're trying to be clear, and we certainly don't want them to clam up when it comes to contact tracing, but yet it's like we're living in fear that they won't cooperate with contact tracing. So we're saying, well, we can't be too hard on them because then they might not cooperate. And that's just a really awful feeling for a community member to have. We want to feel like we are all in this together. The vast majority of students are being super responsible. And I totally disagree with my colleague who says eight seems like a reasonable number. No number seems like a reasonable number. People you live with are who you socialize with. If you want to socialize with other people, you better be outside more than six feet apart. These kids were not outside more than six feet apart. So eight's not a reasonable number. No gathering is a reasonable number when you're impacting the rest of the community. You're not just making bad choices for you. You're making bad choices for other people. So I don't see how we can continue to say, this is okay. Let's also remember that this very tiny number of people, some of them might very well work in some of our local businesses. I mean, there's that impact too, right? It's not just they're sitting in their rooms doing remote education. They have other parts of their lives too, as I'm sure the contact tracers have determined. And so I understand why our community is frustrated. I don't know why we think it's a good idea to send police to break up a noisy party just so that somebody can get some more sleep next door. But we don't think it's okay to say, you know what? I, and again, we're not talking about sending police to this because we're talking about not sending police to a lot of things. But we are sending police to a noisy party so that the people next door can get some sleep. We are not sending anyone, with the possible exception of now rethinking this a little, to talk to people while they're having a party that is clearly going to have impact on people other than themselves. That doesn't make sense to me. I think it's stupid to respond to noise complaints at the same time we're saying, our hands are tied, we can't do anything too mean to them, or they might not tell us who else they were working with. I just don't know how to express to the community that we can't fix that. 
it just feels like an impossible task. But again, I do want to be clear. I know the vast majority of people are being really responsible. A handful of people often ruin things for other people. I understand that. But just saying eight seems reasonable is not. No social gathering size is a reasonable amount outside of the people you live with. And that's just a fact. And that's going to get worse as the weather gets colder. Are there any other comments or questions at this time? Paul, is there any further comments or parts of the presentation? Uh, uh, I, have more, I have more of the presentations. So, but just the, this is very helpful for me to hear, um, very instructive for us to hear the, the tenor of the council. So I appreciate people sharing that. Nancy Joe, sure. you quickly had your hand up. Did you want to? I have a question unrelated to the UMass thing. So if he's got more presentation, I'll ask it at the end. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So our next thing is continuity of operations. I showed this to you previously. We're all in, we're in good shape on all fronts. Um, very minimal um, impact on our organization so far. So you go to the next slide. So on Thursday, um, there's a lot of things happening here, but the one thing I want to highlight is on Thursday, we're doing, a, we're re, re bringing back the call in show at noon. It, you can call in, literally call in on your telephone. We're, we really are directing this one towards seniors. Uh, we have the director of senior services and our acting health director who are going to be there. And we've, we've sensed um, that there's a lot of concern and anxiety among seniors. So we're trying to focus this one for seniors and educate and putting the word out that we're, we'll try to address as many of the comments as possible that seniors bring, uh, because this has created a lot of anxiety and a lot of um, tension for seniors, uh, not just for fear of the disease, but also the social isolation. So we want to start to talk about ways and people, we can help with people on that, in that front. Uh, next slide. So we talked about the call-in number, um, which is, um, is monitored seven days a week. The thing that we started doing last weekend was to actually answer the phone live on Friday and Saturday nights when we receive the call, the most calls. Um, to be, and we still will respond to them in, in, um, after the fact as well, but we want it there to be um, ambassadors. Uh, and uh, there's a, a police officer who's also able to answer the calls at the same time so we can help address things and. Um, listen to people's concerns immediately. And, and if there's a response that's available, we would do that. I will get more information about that tomorrow. We have our, our core team meeting tomorrow morning. So I'll learn more about how that actually worked. And, um, but we do know that um, we have received 238 calls, uh, 150 calls, 88 emails since we started the program. It shows that there is demand for this, that there are people who have concerns. Um, and some are repeats, but a lot of you know, unique uh, calls um, that we've been receiving. So it's a lot of work to respond to them, but um, usually really good um, questions that people have. So we appreciate people calling and encourage people to continue to call. Next slide. Um, our ambassadors are out on the streets. Uh, they have had 1,170 interactions, as they call it. They document any kind of, uh, of interaction they have. They write down notes on how the interaction went. Um, they been distributing masks. Many of them are going out um, to university students. They make house calls on uh, off-campus housing. They go as a group. They carry bags of goodies that they give out to folks, including masks and things like that. Try to do an educational component. Um, they have been going to different neighborhoods uh, period on, on different, at different times, usually Thursday afternoon, Friday afternoon, three to five, and other than make a big push on October 24th, I think, to do a, a real blanket thing um, throughout, the, throughout the area. So, um, you know, a really good team being built here by Kat Newman, who is our the lead uh, ambassador. Next slide. So they are working regular shifts. Um, they walk around downtown. They have those yellow shirts on. Um, here they are at the farmer's market, uh, listening to people, talking to people, explain to people what their job is. A lot of people are coming up to them and just saying, you know, why are you here? Um, you know, they're handing out masks and they see people who are unmasked. They um, 
And you know, just it's, it's when you read the some of some of the anecdotal things, it's really interesting to see the kinds of interactions. And uh, and a lot of times they're getting really positive feedback from the members of the community who saying thank you for doing this. It's really important work that you're doing. So it's it's been a really good program, I think, so far. Um, next slide. And then this is Winston um, on the job, uh, sleeping as usual. Um, and next slide. So just have a couple recent updates and then we'll go to any questions. So first, one good piece of news from the university, they agreed this afternoon to provide regular asymptomatic testing for all town of Amherst first responders and our inspectors. These are the people who are, when a call comes in to the COVID hotline or just a regular complaint and we have to send someone out to visit a house, these are people who are walking out, walking, walking into these houses. Um, uh, for the police and fire, they know the addresses of the people who are COVID positive, so they know when to wear a P full PPE when they go to these houses. But some houses you may not know um, if someone is, is infected or not. So we really appreciate that the university has stepped forward and offered this um, their marvelous testing facility for our first responders. And a press release went out on that this afternoon. The other good piece of good news for us is that we did receive a grant of 129,000 plus um, from the Mass Department of Transportation to continue to work with our downtown businesses to create streetscapes that will encourage people to um, utilize the downtown area um, and properly socially and properly socially distanced um, and to put in other you know we're think we're working with the bid and the chamber to think other ways that we can help. Um, encourage people to, to help our businesses survive. One of the things they're talking about is a, um, you know, sort of a pledge that you pledge to buy a meal a week, take out from, from the, from, uh, or three meals a week, whatever, from our downtown establishments to help sustain them during the, the, um, the winter, sort of like community supported agriculture, where you say, I'm gonna pay you a certain amount and you provide the food. Um, we're hoping that getting enough people to do something like that will support our, our local businesses. Providing some heat lamps where they can uh, extend their season a little bit longer. Um, we're also thinking as we do these things about the spring, it's not just about this short period of time when we know before too long, it's just gonna be too cold outside. Um, but we're also looking at being ready to, for the spring. So when the weather starts to break, we can get people back out and start um, getting, I think getting people outside as much as possible. Um, we're looking at uh, possibly adjusting some of the traffic or the the, um, the barriers so that it's much easier for people to pull up in front of a restaurant and pick up their food. So there's a lot of creative thinking going on um, and this grant will help us in, in a major way. So I thank the State Department of Transportation for supporting this. So if there are other questions that people have, we can take that down. Me, I know you had your hand up earlier, so please go ahead. Mine is about Halloween. Um, <laughs> I saw LSSE put out something today about a car parade. Um, Northampton and many other communities are putting out some sort of guidelines for actual trick-or-treating. Are we looking at putting out guidelines for trick-or-treating around town and yeah. how it can be done safely? Yes, we will have something out this week because I know this weekend is probably going to be the first where people start really focusing on their kids' costumes. Some kids have been focused on their costumes for a long time. Um, there is going to be the car parade for the that LSSC is organizing, um, you know, and I got something in, in the email this afternoon. I did not read it yet about an update on where their plans are, but I'll share that out with the council as we see. But I think, you know, our goal is to have something out to the community this week. Okay, thank you. Matt DeAngelis. Uh, yes, uh, thank you for the work that you're doing. Um, and I agree that the ambassadors are quite important. What they're doing is important. But many, many weeks ago, um, a question was asked, were any of the ambassadors young people of color? And I'm asking that question again, because after seeing the photos, I don't see any young people of color. Um, and I'm concerned that the town is only hiring, ac hopefully accidentally, only white people. I don't know the answer to that because I don't see them. I, I just see the, the appointments going through, but I, I will double check on that for you, Pat, and get back to the full council. Thank you very much. Dorothy has her hand up. Um, 
I'm assuming that regular trick or treating can take place. I mean, I'm thinking about what comes to my house and they're, they're groups, small groups. And I know that what many families have done is they've made a, um, a pod. And I expect trick or treating would be in the pods that people have made with maybe two families who have been socializing together through this time. Um, I don't see big random groups of kids coming, um, but I do want to know whether that's considered to be okay or not okay. So I don't have an answer for you, Dorothy, but I, you know, we will put out some guidelines. I mean, if a street says we want to all trick or treat at each other's houses, we're not going to put a cruiser up there and tell them they can't go trick or treating, but we want everybody in the community to say, yeah, this is sort of the guidelines that we're working for working along. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll ask for a cooperation for the full community to, you know, if we're not, if we're, I just don't want to speculate on what, what the answer might be, but that we're not doing trick or we're not doing Halloween this year, or we are doing it, you know. Right. But like, for example, Lincoln Avenue has often closed the street and had a party, so I assume those kind of things are not going to happen. And parades are not uh, in person parades, but um, the way trick or treating has taken place on my, at least on my block, has been socially distanced in small groups. Darcy. Pine View Drive has, you know, historically been a really big trick or treating area. Um, at Orchard Valley, um, generally. And um, a lot of families actually come from other communities and drop their kids off. <laughs> and they make the rounds on Pine View Drive. Um, but um, I did hear from at least one constituent who expressed that she didn't think there should be any trick or treating this year. Um, and um, I, I can kind of relate to that. Um, but, you know, I don't have to have my light on. I, I don't have to participate. If I'm over 70, obviously, if you're over 70, you can just turn off your light and be an old Scrooge, right? <laughs> Um, but you could leave your light on and put the candy bowl on the porch, stand at your door, your storm door, and show excitement and amazement as the children come by. I'm just so concerned about children and the quality of their life. I think it's a serious problem. Charlie. Yeah, I still have a question about the ambassadors and there's a lot of, like, it seems like they have a lot of interactions, like 1,170 interactions. I'm not sure what is the, like, is there any qualitative data on what is happening in those interactions? And I'm also still not clear what happens when someone makes a call about there being a party or when they have concerns, what are the actions being taken at the back end? So two, two questions there. One, the interactions, you know, they do little synopsis of what of any real uh, interaction that they have. Many, the majority of those interactions are things that are organized through the university, that they're going out in with bags to um, group where group uh, students are living um, and they're giving them bags so that they might go to a house and there might be six people there um, uh, and so they might, that they, that would be six interactions. They, they, they tabulate that way. Um, the ones that they're doing, like the interactions downtown, um, where they, they're walking in the mass required zone, those are usually pretty much always very positive interactions. Um, and, um, and they're offering masks, you know, they, um, offered a mask to a, a, a gentleman in town who, um, typically is on the street a lot. And, and he said they always, people always give me paper masks. They don't look, I don't, I don't want paper masks. They get wet too quickly for me. So they had, they had cloth masks and they were very grateful to receive a, a cloth mask. And they were like, oh, that's a good win for us. That was a positive interaction. Um, so it, it, it varies, you know, I think the way they count interactions is, you know, if you walked up to the farmer, to the, at the farmer's market, that, you know, three people walked up, that would be three interactions, right? Uh, in terms of what happens right now, um, we uh, respond back. We, if there is a call for, on the COVID hotline, um, if it's something about you know too many cars in the driveway or something, we refer, refer that to inspection services. It, it sometimes it usually gets funneled into either police 
or inspection services or health. It depends what what the what the actual complaint is or concern is. Um, you know, and again, I have not had an update on this weekend where we had people answering the phone live. These are usually things that come in overnight, left a message, emailed, um, and you can feel the tension that people have when they're emailing or calling because they are concerned. Um, and we try to get back to them right away to say we, we, we talk to the police. And um, we do have the, the, the weekly meeting, you know, um, that where the university and the, and the town go through every call that came into the police department. They do look at the, the COVID line as well. And they start strategizing on this, this house again, let's go and make another visit to that house. Let's start to um, educate them a little bit, get a little more education to that house. I hope that answers your question. Alyssa? Uh, I just have to be a little, um, just have to interject my Halloween Scrooge. And I already had written to Paul about this that just said, you know, let's take the lead. And so I appreciate that he said he's going to work on getting something out this week. Um, I would hope that whatever that is, since he's been clear that we don't know what it is yet, that it will specify in there that it's clear that many residents who love this holiday every year are not going to participate. And so I appreciate what you said, Darcy, about, well, we won't, I won't turn my light on, um, but many residents will not participate. And so if people are planning to go trick-or-treating here, they will show up in neighborhoods where things are not all lit up because everybody's gonna be trick-or-treating and many people are not going to wanna to participate. I also just wanna push back a little bit on the fact that, you know, I get that kids need a lot of things. I miss the costume parade, the pumpkin roll, the fun activities carnival. LSSC always does a really nice job with all these things because, you know, some neighborhoods have parties, but LSSC has always been there for the kids across the community. But you can't say that trick-or-treating looks socially distanced because you've never seen socially distanced trick-or-treating. And we all know what a struggle it is to tell our kids not to put the candy in their mouth before they get home. They're obviously not sanitizing their hands in and out of the communal bowl. Every kid, Every group has a kid with a runny nose. We all know this. These are reality points. So whatever we decide to do, let's just be clear that we as a community are not embracing, oh, let's just pretend trick or treat's great and we can stand at our storm doors and somehow we're, that's all gonna work out. I think it's great if we can specify, hey, there's gonna be a parade. Um, and if you as a community wanna do something special in your community that's your pod, awesome. To say that the entire community is just going to try and pretend it's a normal year. It's not a normal year. Yeah, so uh, I agree. So I was thinking I'm 63 and I love Halloween. And to my knowledge, there's been a municipal order to cancel Halloween once in my 63 years. And that was during Snowtober mm -hmm. here in Amherst. I think that was 10 years ago or something like that. And there was a reverse 911 call saying, please don't go out on October 31st. You know, we'll, we'll set up something a week later. But this feels like that year. This feels like the year that we should not be encouraging. In fact, we should be discouraging trick-or-treating for all the reasons stated. So if we're freaking out about eight UMass students, we also need to be freaking out about eight, you know, potential vectors going door to door. I mean, I can't think of anything more of a super spreader potential than than groups going door to door around Amherst. So I um, I guess I kind of agree in the, with the sentiment that we shouldn't be agnostic about this, that we should take a position that it's simply not a good year for this. And, and we are on an incredibly busy street, so busy that we've been visited by the ambassadors. Um, but um, I just, I don't see it. I'm, I, I uh, look forward to October 31st every year. We go through bags and bags and bags of candy and I'm gonna have my lights out and be in the back room. It's, and I am heartbroken by that, but I can't um, contribute. Thanks, Shalini. Yeah, another question that came up is the university that's providing the testing, um, they are charging the town for it is there any was there any kind of negotiation or where we could because it is very expensive so i don't know what that arrangement is what are how are we reimbursing them 
And second, could we include teachers? Are teachers considered first responders? Uh, teachers are not considered first responders. Um, okay. And I know the superintendent has um, has suggested that to the university, and I'm sure they would think about that. Um, I think the they recognize first responders are different than teachers. I would really differentiate that. Um, we yeah. have funds under the CARES Act to support this activity. It's perfectly okay. legitimate use of the funds. We have uh, funds available, and I think this is a very viable thing to um, to compensate the university for um, the university. This is not free to the university. Um, so I, I want to recognize that they put a lot of infrastructure in place to make this happen. We would like to take advantage of it. I think it's only responsible on our part to to bear the cost of the test. It's not that it's actually not that much that very expensive. They've got a really good deal um, from the Broad Institute because they're such a big they purchase so many tests from the Broad Institute. Um, so and it's just you know we could not get that level of service anywhere else. So it's a small price to pay to make sure that our first responders or inspectors they feel that we care about their health too. And there's it's a big concern for our inspectors you know, who, are, who are being asked to go. You know, we've developed all kinds of um, systems in place to you know, inspect houses remotely or via you know, FaceTime or something like that. But there's still times when people have to go out and look at something in person. And it's, it's our responsibility to give them as much protection as we can. Right, thank you, that's helpful. Dorothy? Just one last Halloween thought. Um, yes, Alyssa got me with a communal candy bowl. But since on my street people come as families, I can do as I've done at other holidays and have little separate bags, little separate paper bags, which they sell in the store with some stuff on the table. I do agree, no communal candy bars, bowls. You really did paint a good picture there, Alyssa. Are there any other comments at this time? Paul, any final comments or Jen, any final comments? No, I, I just think that, you know, we're working through this and I appreciate, I really value the comments that you gave. And if you have thoughts afterwards, please convey them to me because, you know, we're as a, you know, just trying to make the best decisions we can for the town um, and love hearing from our, our the members of the public um, as we, as we try to use our, we lead with public health. What is the, what is in the best, public health metric. What's in alignment with the governor and the state? We try to maintain those two things. And that's why the data is so critical to our decision-making. So the, the lens we always look through is, is this in the best interest of public health? And that's why Jen, who is a public health professional and Julie before her were so valuable because they forced us. We, we, I hear all the you know concerns of all the neighbors and all those things like that. They are able to focus it on what really matters in public health. And, and it's been very helpful to focus on that. Thank you, Paul. Um, we are going to take a five minute break. We will reconvene at 810. When you come back, please turn your picture back on so I know that you're back. So I wanna go back and make sure people can hear us and we can hear you. Um, Pat DeAngelis. Yes. Darcy Dumont. Not yet. Bruce Mers, yes. Haneke, yes. Yes? Yes. <laughs> no. uh, Dorothy Pam. I think we've lost Dorothy. Athena, we have lost Dorothy Pam. I'll call her. Okay. Evan Ross. Here. Uh, George Ryan. I'm here. I'm here. Uh, Pam is here. Thank you. Uh, Kathy Shane. She's here. Steve Schreiber. Here. Steinberg. Here. Sports. Here. Dumont. Here. Brewer. How about Paul Milne? Yes, I'm here. Melissa?
Alyssa Brewer, can you hear us? Yes, Alyssa Brewer can hear you. Thank you. Okay, we are moving on to the presidential election warrant. Uh, this is the warrant that authorizes the election on November 3rd. I'm going to make the motion and look for a second to authorize the warrant for the presidential election on Tuesday, November 3rd, 2020. The is open from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. at the following locations. District 1, Voting Precinct 1, North Zion Korean Church, Church Hall, 1193 North Pleasant Street, District 2, Voting Precinct 2, the high school, District 1, Voting Precinct 3, Emanuel Lutheran Church, uh, District 3, Voting Precinct 4, Amherst Regional High School. District 4, Voting Precinct 5, Bangs Community Center. District 2, Voting Precinct 6, Port River School. District 5, Voting Precinct 7, Crocker Farm School. District 5, Voting Precinct 8, Munson Memorial Library. District 4, Voting Precinct 9, Wildwood school and district three voting precinct 10 amherst regional pelham regional high school is there a second second de angelis thank you Paul. okay any further discussion or questions at this time okay seeing none we're going to i'm sorry go ahead shalini Oh, just a quick question, which I, uh, I had sent to Paul earlier about Crocker Farm. Can I ask, is that the appropriate time to ask about it? Yes, please. Uh, so one of the um, inform, uh, poll workers said that it was crowded in Cro Crocker Farm. And I heard back from Paul saying that the space is calculated based, uh, you know, they've made the calculations for the space. And I was just hoping that he could elaborate and explain that a little more so we can communicate with people in our district, what that means. Um, so, yeah, so um, Jeremiah, has, our facilities manager has gone to every polling location and we are actually had the fortunate, the fortune to be able to see them in action. Um, some of them have enormous space, so it's not not an issue. Um, Crocker Farm is in the library, so it's a it feels like a smaller space because there's lots of stacks of books there. But it's it's actually a fairly decent sized room. Um, the we have four or it might be six. There there are four um, stand up um, voting locations or polling locations uh, um, booths in Crocker Farm, and then there's one for people who, you know, who are handicapped or want, want need to sit down to vote as well. Um, that will limit the number of people who can be in the building at, in the, in the precinct at any one time. So one of the things that the Secretary of State's office said to use is, if you're limited on space, use time as your ally. So we will have people stand outside. They don't, we don't have to crowd everybody into the same voting space until it's, it's able to be cleared. So we will have people queued up outside, so they can become they can come in. Um, you know, we did have a lot of um, poll workers, and there was when there was an, a turnover in poll workers. It seems like there's twice as many people, so that's one thing that um, the clerk is taking into consideration that maybe we don't have the shift change all at once. Maybe there's some staggered shift change, so mm. there, you don't have like five people there all changing jobs at the same time. So. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, I would like to also add, uh, could we post on our website when ballots uh, that are going to be mailed out are available and how to track them? Sure. Uh, I think it is on our website, but we can make it more more prominent. And I tried to put a little bit of that in the town manager report, but it is important for people to know the options for voting and how they can track their ballot. We do not, we will not, um, we do not have the material from the Secretary of State's office to be able to mail the ballots out to people who have requested a mail-in ballot at this moment in time, but everything is ready. The clerk's office has every, uh, all the return, all the envelopes of, for people who have requested ballots ready to go. They just need this one last thing from the Secretary of State's office. Thank you. Andy, you have a question? Yes. Um, 
Following up on what Shalini's question was, uh, one thing you didn't mention at Cocker Farms, which is actually my largest concern about that location as it's currently set up, is poll watchers. And uh, we don't know that uh, a candidate is going to try and flood the uh, polling places in Amherst to try and uh, sway our uh, voters. But uh, the campaigns themselves frequently just have somebody there for various reasons. Multiple campaigns may do so because they use it as a method of uh, finding out if the votes are turning out that they're expecting to turn out at the uh, on election day. So uh, is that going to pose a problem for us? No, every polling location has an area for poll watchers to stand in. We don't have to provide seating for poll watchers, but we do and you can limit the number of poll watchers. You ask the poll watchers to coordinate themselves. If there's 10 people who show up and you only have room for four, you can tell them you have to coordinate your activities. That's as the uh, Secretary of State's office has a pretty detailed um, memo on that from about four years ago that we that we that we go by. And Jeremiah has taken that into account. I don't think he actually had it taped off last time. I think that's in his intention this time is to tape off where poll watchers can can actually be. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dorothy, with your hand up. Okay. Maybe I misheard, but we received our absentee ballots today. Did you? Okay, then yeah. I'm behind the times. All right, so everything's in here. Okay. Okay, are there other questions from the council at this one? Okay, seeing none, then I'm going to go ahead and we're going to begin the votes. Um, Darcy Dumont. Yes. Then Grace Mercy, yes. Mandy Jo Haneke. Yes. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Evan Ross. Yes. George Ryan. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Steve Schreiber. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Sarah Schwartz. Yes. Stanley Balmill? Yes. Alyssa Brewer? Yes. Pat DeAngelis? Yes. The vote's unanimous to support this motion. Uh, we are moving on to um, the zoning bylaw 14 temporary zoning. And this is a little tricky in that we're going to be looking potentially at some recommended changes, but Paul will speak to that. They may not be ready yet, but once they are, what we want to do is create automatic referral. So they go to committees instead of having to come back to the council and be referred. So that's what the motion will be about. But Paul, why don't you speak to zoning article 14? So zoning article 14, if you recall, was something that the council passed, I think Jan June 16th for 180 days that uh, delegated power to the building commissioner to take certain actions. Um, that, those, that power expires, so six months later, which would be December 16th, whatever the exact date is. Um, uh, the council president and other councilors were asking, like, should we extend that? What, what has happened with that so far? So what we're preparing, the building commissioner is preparing a um, a report on how that has been utilized, what has been utilized without the bylaw, which would have been done under this, um, the governor's order, what was done within the bylaw, and if there are any changes that the building commission thinks would be helpful going forward. And we'll have put that into a memo that will be uh, given to the council. With this vote tonight, it'll automatically get referred and then come back to the council in time for you to act enact it by, uh, by December. So if I'm correct, Paul, there could be some changes asked for in the bylaw, as well as an extension of the date. Correct. Okay. Um, Mandy Jo, you have your hand up. Yeah, I, I don't have a question. I, I more of, as chair of CRC wanted to let the council know, but also Paul know. Um, the chair of the planning board and I have tentatively scheduled a joint hearing for whatever changes there may be made on this for the required public hearings that are required for November 4th, in order to get them noticed in time, 
the paper has to know by October 16th because of the two week publication requirement. So I wanted to put that out there for Paul and the group um, because we'll need it by the end of this week and all to get the right notices for the planning department to, you know, or early next week for the planning department to put the required public notices together. Um, the reason it seems early is because if the hearings are held on the 4th, the first reading for the council can be on the 9th. And that might mean there's a little bit backwards with GOL. Um, the second reading for the council and a vote can then be on the 16th. We have a meeting on the 9th and the 16th. We then don't meet till December 7th. Um, once a, the council votes, uh, the changes don't take effect for 14 days. The current bylaw is set to expire on December 14th so that December 7th council meeting is seven days too late to get any changes effective, including an extension before the current bylaw expires. So it might seem a very tight timeline, but that's the reason. And I just thought I'd let the council know that. Thank you, Andy Jo, for also uh, going through the process of the rationale of why we're coming to people, to the council at this point with the motion that I'm ready to read unless there's additional questions, although we can wait for that after the motion. Darcy? I'm pretty unclear about this. Um, this is because we don't think we have enough time to bring it to uh, a full council meeting or? The, the present, um, first of all, the present bylaw expires in mid-December, okay? And in addition to extending the time period, there may also be some changes. However, the people from um, zoning, licensing, et cetera, have not had time to pull together their complete recommendation, but they will be doing that, we hope, no later than the end of this week, the beginning of next. And so what we're, at the motion tonight is to allow that once those are ready, they will automatically be referred to the planning board, to the zone, to um, CRC, and to um, GOL. And the reason is, is because we have no meeting on Monday because of the holiday. We have a meeting on the October 19th. Then we don't have a meeting again until after the election. And we have, then we have two meetings in November, November 9th and November 16th. And then we don't have another meeting until December 7th. And so in order to meet all of the time frames of having another hearing through planning board and CRC and all of the notices to have that hearing, as well as then having it come back to the council to be read twice at two different council meetings, we needed to backtrack and start moving the timeline along. And when you say that it has to be read twice at council meetings, are, are we talking about a total zoning bylaw overhaul? No, no, this is just the zoning bylaw that was put in place as the temporary measure to help our downtown businesses during COVID. It's all it is, is bylaw 14. Oh, so, that's all this is about absolutely. the automatic referral, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Oh, I this didn't, has, this I didn't is not the big zoning bylaw reform. We would never do that to you <laughs> or anybody. Okay. Does that, does that make sense now, Darcy? Yeah. Kathy, question. I think the problem is the way the actual wording of the motion is, Lynn. The I read it three times to try to figure out what this was. It says the zoning temporary is right as a title, but it says motion to blah, 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 blah. It never says motion to refer the temporary zoning article, whatever, in the motion. So it looks yeah. like all zoning is zipping in. It's just missing. 
So if you just read those words, that's what it looks like. It looks like the speed train um, for everything. Yeah, it's pretty confusing. And, and not only that, we're going to get it all done by November 9th, which would also be stunning. I, 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 I understand the issue. So let me try this out. It's not the actual motion, but I, I would amend it to read to automatically refer, refer any proposed changes to the temporary zoning bylaw 14 or to zoning bylaw 14 temporary zoning recommended by the planning department to the planning board and community resources committee for review joint hearing and recommendation and to the governance organization and legislation committee for review and recommendation by november 9th so I will insert what we're referring to, okay? All right, so here is the motion. To automatically refer any proposed changes to zoning bylaw 14-temporary zoning recommended by the planning department to the planning board and community resources committee for review, joint hearing and recommendation and to the governance organization and legislation committee for review and recommendation by November 9th. Is there a second? Kianicki seconds. Thank you. Any further discussion or questions? I think those were excellent points to be made. Alyssa. I think that's what happens when I reviewed the motion sheet and once again was waylaid by the title of the motion, not the content of the motion. We have a tendency to do that, to put the content in the title, not in the motion itself. So um, <clears throat> that was very helpful the way you reworded it there. So thank you. The other thing I just want to point out is, I mean, it was clear from the material in our packet, I thought, but at any rate, is that we said when we put this into place and people had some misgivings putting this into place, that we would get feedback about how it had worked. And we've gotten zero in terms of actual substantive feedback up until this point. So it is important that, that they pull that together and that staff do that amongst all the millions of other things that they're doing. So we can show the community that this was a smart thing to do and that it's a smart thing to extend it. And I hope that there isn't going to be anything in there that's going to be too startling or surprising to people in the community. I hope there are minor tweaks in addition to the timing, because as you point out, we have this very tight time frame. And I don't want to derail what is obviously from, you know, the general comments we've been hearing from everyone, a good thing over something complex that gets inserted at the last moment. So I'm assuming it's going to be very minor tweaks and timing and that if it's more than that, that we get the heads up on that sooner rather than later so we can help work that through with our community in addition to the actual public hearing that'll have to be held. So I really appreciate Mandy Joe keeping track of all those deadlines. And all of those items will be advanced to everybody at the time that they are advanced to the planning board in CRC. Okay. Uh, Darcy. Um, I am interested in seeing how it has gone in the last 180 days. I was, I may have been the only person who voted against it originally, although there may have been some other people. Um, but um, I am not generally interested in extending it. And, you know, I'll, I will vote to have it referred because I think we need to have a public hearing on it. Um, but um, I continue to think that um, I want more resident participation in what we do in our town government participation by the planning board and the design review board, et cetera. That, and there isn't any particular reason why we need to change our processes. So anyway, but I will vote for it tonight. Okay. Mandy Jo. Um, it's somewhat related to zoning bylaw 14, but we, at the same time we passed zoning bylaw 14, we passed a amendment to the town council policy on delegation of public ways or delegating authority on public ways. I forget what the title of the policy is. Um, we should, the manager, I asked that the manager look at that to see if any 
concurrent changes are required for that too. It's not as tight of a timeline because it doesn't require a public hearing because it's a council policy, but it'd be good to do them at the same time. And if, the, if there are any, then those would be referred to TSO. Town council policies generally go to GOL. A public way? It's, it's a policy delegating a town council authority. Okay. But, but no, it would it, be both. It went, it went to public. I think it went to both last time. Yeah, it did. It went to public way and then to GOL. Um, Paul, comment on any of this? Oh, we will we will get those to you um, hopefully this week so everybody will see what is being recommended. I, I don't think there'll be many surprises in, in it. and I really haven't had a detailed conversation with the building commissioner and planning director about exactly if they, were, they had some tweaks they didn't think it was significant though. Okay. And any comment on the public way issue? No, yeah, I think that's a, that's a good point on that and I'll work on, I'll look at that and see what, because we did make them concurrent it makes sense to stay that way. Um, should we be amending the bylaw to include TSO and on that one as well then? I mean, amending, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, amending the motion to include TSO. So the motion is just for the bylaw itself. Yeah. yeah. There's a separate, I, I think you can refer that one if there are changes at October 19th, there'll be plenty of time. Yeah, yeah. okay, agree. All right, so the motion, which has been made and seconded, is to automatically refer any proposed changes to zoning bylaw 14 temporary zoning recommended by the planning department to the planning board and community resources committee for review, joint hearing and recommendation and to the governance organization and legislation committee for review and recommendation by November 9th. Any further discussion? And we'll move to a vote and we start with Griesburn. It's a yes. Haneke? Yes. Pam? Yes. Evan Ross? Yes. George Ryan? Yes. Kathy Shane? Yes. Steve Schreiber? Yes. Steinberg? Yes. Sarah Schwartz? Yes. Shalini Balmil. Yes. Melissa Brewer. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Pat DeAngelis. Yes. Thank you, Pat. Darcy Dumont. Yes. Okay, it passes 13-0-0. Uh, we're moving on to the Second reading of the uh, single use plastic bag prohibition. And what I've asked is, although you have a very extensive report that was in your previous packet and also in tonight's packet. However, what I've asked is that instead we put the actual motion up on the screen because the motion has now been edited. Now, Serge, you're going to go to the motion sheet. Uh, just a second, I'm making sure I have the right document. Certainly. Okay, got it right here. And uh, you want to go all the way to uh, 8C. And that would be it right there. Okay, so the motion, the way the motion appears, it shows you in uh, strikeout what's been eliminated. It shows you what's been added in um, 
by using bold and it shows you what's the same by it being just kept as normal. So um, I'm going to make the motion. I'm not going to read the entire bylaw since you all have copies of it. So the motion is to amend bylaw 3.28 single use plastic bag prohibition by deleting the language shown in strike through and adding the language in bold, et cetera. Is there a second? I second it. That was Darcy, thank you. So what I would like to do is um, then ask uh, if there are questions at this time, but I wanna start with George Ryan who followed up with both the Board of Health and the business community. Sure, thank you, Lynn. Um, I reached out per the request to uh, the Chamber, the Amherst Bid and the Board of Health um, to see what they could add to the discussion. Uh, the results of that are in the report from GOL. I'll just touch on it very briefly. Really, there wasn't much to be learned. Um, the bid and the chamber had no objections to the bylaw. They are not aware of any concerns or difficulties from their members. Um, after five years of, of the ban, um, the assumption is that most, if not all businesses are aware of the restriction. Um, I asked the Board of Health about enforcement matters. And apparently we could only, there weren't any that they could uh, point to. Um, there was one exemption that uh, was discovered in those five years and that was it. So um, that's what I learned. Okay. Are there any further comments or questions from the council? Evan Ross. But so first of all, thank you, George, for following up since I was one of the people who requested that information um, and I found your report to be really helpful. You mentioned the Board of Health uh, in five years said that they had one deferment, but it, it didn't say whether that deferment was in the past or currently active. My assumption is it's no longer active. That, that is correct. Okay, thank you. Darcy DeMont, you have your hand up. I just wanted to clarify that the parts of the um, most of the parts that are in bold are not added per se. They were in the original uh, bylaw that um, preceded the ad hoc review committee. So many of them the original added back in. So right. So it, this was. Most of what's been done here is just maintaining it in its original version with some, some changes along the way that happened in the GOL committee. Um, but that was my original intent, just to, to maintain okay. in large part what was in the original. Okay. And uh, Alyssa, you have your hand up. Well, since that came up, I feel compelled to point out that that's why this was such a mess the last time it was presented to us, because someone was trying to rewind time. The reality was that we had replaced that bylaw. A majority of us voted to replace that bylaw. So what is in front of you right now is an accurate representation, as it should be, unlike the last one we were provided, of what has changed between the bylaw we accepted and the bylaw we are going to have now. This type of, this is covered in both our rules and in past practice in terms of bold and unreal. I appreciate that the context is that it's returning things much to the way they were before, but the reality is a change was made, the bylaw changed, period, end of story, and now it's being changed again. So thank you for that. George okay. Ryan. Yeah, the, the one, I think, request that came from my conversations with the bid in the chamber was that uh, there be some consideration of the fact that the ban had been suspended and now is has been uh, removed again. Um, I don't think enforcement's going to be, be a big issue. 
um, because it's essentially, as far as I can tell, driven by consumer complaint, that there be some consideration given um, to businesses in the first month or two um, as they go back to um, finding replacements for the plastic bags they've been using. And so, this is all related to COVID. Yeah. Okay. Mandy Jo? Yeah, I, I don't, I just want to respond to that and say I don't want us to get bogged down on that because the bylaws in effect right now, once the governor removed his suspension, we have one on the books, it's still in effect. Um, we've never suspended ours. So that request should go to the Board of Health. Um, what we're doing today isn't going to change the fact that once the governor lifted his order, they had to go back to not using plastic bags because we had one on the books. So if they're seeking any type of non-enforcement, that should go to the Board of Health for a request. All right, any other comments at this time? The motion's been made and seconded. I uh, will begin the vote and I will begin with Haneke. Yes. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Evan Ross. Yes. George Ryan. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Um, Steve Schreiber. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Sarah Schwartz. Yes. Chalini Balmil. Yes. Alyssa Brewer. Yes. And Pat DeAngelis. Yes. Darcy Dumont. Yes. Are you frozen, Lynn? And Lynn Grease Mercy, yes. I'm frozen. Oh, thank you. Did I unfreeze? <laughs> we are going to move past appointments because we've done all of those. We're going to go to committee and liaison reports. Mandy Jo. Um, not much to report. I already mentioned that the tentative hearing for if there are any changes to zoning bylaw article 14 will be um, November 4th. I think it's tentatively scheduled for 8 p.m. Um, but we'll, we'll be working on that over the next week and a half to make sure it's noticed in time and that it gets on the bulletin board and all in time for everything. Um, we had a nice discussion on housing, comprehensive housing policy and on moving forward with zoning bylaw priorities. Um, we'll continue both of those discussions going forward and I'll keep you updated and probably write a report soon with more detail on both of those. If you have your hand up, do you have a question or a comment? Uh, my comment is just I need to leave the minute meeting early, so I don't want you to think that I uh, lost connection. I'm leaving on purpose. <laughs> Thank you, Kathy. We appreciate that. Before you leave, anything on JCPC? Uh, no, JCPC, the, we just had the one meeting in September, and we won't be meeting again until February-ish um, after uh, okay. decisions are made and how much the town has to spend for the following year. Okay. Andy, Finance Committee. Yes, very briefly. Uh, last time we met, I uh, made reference to the fact that the next meeting will be tomorrow and uh, gave the date. Um, it is still tomorrow that we're meeting at 2 p.m. Uh, there <laughs> is reference in the town manager's report to information that has been developed by staff to present to the Finance Committee for consideration regarding the inventory issues, uh, capital issues, and uh, the, uh, uh, the, the fourth quarter and year-end finance report, amongst other material. Uh, the Finance Committee packet is available on the town website um, and so that it can be easily found if you have problems finding it and you're interested, then just shoot me a private email and I will send you the link to it to make it easy for you. Uh, the uh, uh, Finance Committee has not been using SharePoint because we have members of the committee who are not counselors. So, Andy, I just want to 
correct and, and check, the meeting is at 2.30 tomorrow, not 2 o'clock. No, I believe it is at two o'clock because uh, we had a little bit of a mix up and it was posted for 2 p.m. I think that Athena caught the error and has and pointed it out to us. So Athena, do you want to just confirm that it's two o'clock tomorrow? Posted mm -hmm. for two o'clock tomorrow. Thank you. Okay. Um, GOL, George. Yeah, um, just first of all, we meet on Wednesday, this Wednesday, the 7th. And the hope is that we will uh, complete our review of the two wage theft bylaws. And um, we're also going to be looking, at least on the agenda, we have an item concerning uh, exotic animals. Uh, I call it the wild animal bylaw. Um, that's also on the agenda. Um, but I, hopefully you've had a chance to look at the report. We, In the last meeting, we struggled with two, I call them procedural issues related to GOL. And I described them in, in great detail, painful detail in the uh, report. Um, and I don't know if we want to get into it now, but we should be aware of them. Also, there are two appendices in the report. Um, one of them is the, the KP law uh, review of the wage theft bylaw. And I felt it was important that, that counselors have access to it and they read it. Um, so rather than have me discuss it or repeat it all now, since this is not an item that we're really dealing with at the moment, um, just draw your attention to it and encourage you to read uh, those sections um, at some point before we return to that discussion. Are there questions of George uh, or statements? Pat? Yeah, I, I just wanted to say that one of the things that the KP Law Summary says is that uh, the wage theft bylaws aspects of them are in conflict with state law. That's quite inaccurate. Um, the other thing I want to uh, bring up is that we had a discussion in GOL about whether or not sponsors should be able to participate in voting or um, discussion during a committee meeting. And I was wondering whether TSO is considering that as well, particularly since George is on that committee. Um. Darcy or anybody else on, uh, a, a, actually, Alyssa, you have your hand up. Hmm. I had my hand up, yes, thank you. Um, I'll let somebody else address the TSO issue because that was immediately what I thought of when you guys had that discussion. So I appreciate you including that in your report. But the reason I was raising my hand was because I really appreciate, George, that you included the KP law summary in there. And as I wrote back to you and to Paul, I was exceedingly disappointed with KP Law's section on tax increment financing. It was a cut and paste job from some other work they did for someone else and didn't relate to our tax increment financing that we've used here in Amherst at all. So hopefully that will be clarified a little bit before that section, which is a admittedly a small section of the wage theft portion is brought back to us so that that doesn't continue to cause confusion when it was a meaningless set of data that didn't have anything to do with what's actually happening in Amherst. Thank you. Are there any comments on whether TSO has also had this question as to whether sponsors who are also counselors, because counselors are the people who sponsor both bylaws as well as um, um, memorandums of, of, you know, like we passed tonight. Darcy? Yeah, no, we have not brought, we haven't discussed that per se, but it seems like if it's an issue that is being brought up in multiple council committees, then it's a, it's a town council issue. It seems to me like it doesn't fall into the category of what an actual conflict of interest is, but it seems like if it, if it applies, if it's a concern in committees, then we should have a policy for the whole council, right? My, yes, and if we would like, we can put it on an agenda. I will tell you exactly what I said as a member of GOL, and that is that a person who is a counselor has a right to vote at all times. Um, we have never had any restrictions, whether you're a sponsor or whatever, and uh, it's always been clear who the sponsors are. That's my personal position, and at this point, uh, GOL did not um, we didn't take any votes. 
-hmm. So, uh, but we did not make a decision to restrict voting to only people who were not sponsored either. Uh, Dorothy? Well, I totally agree with you. I think to not allow sponsors to vote would result in all kinds of gaming, where if you wanted to vote for an issue, you would try to get somebody else to sponsor it, but you would do the work. I mean, it's like all kinds of strange workarounds. I mean, obviously, we were elected to make decisions, and we have ideas, and we have things that we bring forward, and I think that we all have an equal vote. Andy? So... Um since I was the one who raised the issue at the GOL committee, I want to uh, explain a little bit more about it, about what my concern was and why I was uncomfortable with it. And it does reflect only on the single committee because uh, all of the comments that have been made that uh, just sponsoring a resolution does not create a conflict of interest under the state statute that defines conflict of interest and uh, sponsor members uh, should be free to vote at the council level. And I frankly um, don't have any hesitation whatsoever about other committees. GOL, the reason I was uncomfortable about it is, and um, I use a plastic bag as an example because we just talked about it. There was a lot of discussion that went back and forth between uh, Darcy, who is the sponsor of that particular change and had, had made that request, and the committee to try and work through a series of issues. And the committee had a very clear responsibility, which is to meet the charge of the committee to see that the bylaw that was are, um, being presented for amendment was clear, consistent, and actionable. And uh, uh, the sponsor had a very clear role in advocating to make sure that the uh, amendment came out in a way that would satisfy the committee's interest, but would also satisfy the sponsor's goal. And that process worked, I thought, very well in the example that I just gave. And uh, what was feeling very uncomfortable for me, and I, it's very hard because there are two members of the uh, committee and the council who I really like and respect with greatly, who um, were in this position, but they were in sort of a dual role there. And that was the question that I asked the committee to consider. So I actually think that it is a GOL question, not a, and it is not applicable to TSO or CRC because they really play very different kinds of roles. And it may be that the committee comes to a conclusion that um, despite what I just described, that that's the way it is, uh, and uh, if so, that's what the committee is gonna, uh, going to conclude. But I, I did feel that it was uh, very uncomfortable for me at times because I felt that I was dealing with two members of the committee who were playing two different roles. Yeah. Alyssa? Yeah, maybe we could somehow put this on a future agenda because as much as I love to put everything to the committees themselves to make decisions about, I actually don't think that I can, based on the explanations we've heard tonight, draw that final line between GOL and everybody else because we have people coming to TSO who are TSO members who are convincing us that not only is this a great idea, but it's a great idea for TSO to support it. And I don't know why the clear, consistent and actionable is so very, very different. And, it, and if GOL decided that it was so different that they didn't want sponsors to be able to take part in discussion or vote on the GOL recommendation, then I would wanna rewrite GOL's charge as a town council, because I don't think any counselors should be put in that position of having to define themselves that way when they're on a committee. I suggest that we do exactly what you've suggested and that on a future agenda will be the issue of whether or not 
um, sponsors who are members of committees should be voting on those items when they're in committee. And let's just move on to uh, the rest of our agenda, okay? Um, in fact, uh, TSO, do you have an update? Um, I was not at the last meeting, so I'm gonna um, in a moment ask Evan if he has anything to add to this, but um, we are, um, did hear about, if you read his report, it was very detailed um, about the appointments that we um, just approved through our consent agenda. And um, we've heard once now a presentation about Lincoln Ave, um, and that is detailed in his report also. On October 8th, we're going to hear from the sponsors of the face recognition technology bylaw um, and um, we're also going to uh, get uh, appointments for CDBG advisory commission the design review board and the cultural council this is what we've been promised anyway <laughs> Uh, that's what we're expecting. We hope to get the Community Safety Committee appointments by the October 22nd committee uh, meeting. Um, and then we're on November 5th, we're going to look at um, the other half of the surveillance technology bylaw, which has now been cut in half. The, we're going to look at the surveillance technology piece of it on November 5th. Evan, do you have anything you want to add about what happened in the last meeting? Yeah, just I, the council I know had the report um, to read, but just, I guess, for the sake of the public who might be watching and interested, um, the council had referred the Lincoln Avenue parking recommendation from DPW to uh, TSO back in March. Uh, Many of us may have forgotten that happened. TSO didn't. Um, and in that time, uh, Councilors Ryan and Pam were working on a proposal that sought to expand that recommendation um, beyond the initial one to also include um, the south part of Lincoln and also, uh, thanks Dorothy, Ge basic geography, um, and also uh, sunset. Uh, after a, a fairly lengthy discussion, uh, TSO has decided to um, table that proposal for now. We're recommending for or against, we're just recommending that we not take action at this time, not that we don't take action, but not at this time, um, because we're afforded a really unique opportunity right now with uh, the university suspension of most on-campus classes and, most of it, and much of its operations. Um, the, that provided some relief to Lincoln Avenue parking. And so the feeling is that there is no real pressure to do this immediately. And this opens up an opportunity for TSO to explore parking, residential parking a bit more comprehensively um, because during the public hearing, we heard from other counselors in other districts who cited uh, parking issues or complaints from residents about parking in their districts. Um, and there was some questioning about why Lincoln Ave and why not some of these other areas. And so this just opens up an opportunity for us to have a larger conversation about residential parking with, that will allow us to better contextualize whatever decision is made on Lincoln Avenue. And so I wanna make sure that the people who pushed for the Lincoln Avenue uh, parking changes uh, don't feel that they've been forgotten. Don't feel like we've been, we're recommending against the proposal. We are just using the time that has been afforded to us by this crisis um, to have a larger and more comprehensive conversation about parking so that we can make a better and more informed decision, both about Lincoln Avenue, but also about parking elsewhere in town. Uh, thank you. Are there any questions regarding committee reports? Are there any reports for liaisons? Darcy. The Transportation Advisory Committee had a meeting after a very long break um, this last Thursday. 
is it Thursday? Yeah. Yes. Um, and uh, they just um, uh, discussed what they want to do uh, as a committee in the future. And they are actually, I neglected to mention that they are coming to our meeting, the TSO meeting on the 8th. Uh, Aaron Hayden, their chair, is going to present to us basically on what he sees as the um, relationship of the TAC to the TSO. The, the members pretty much agreed in that meeting on Thursday that they assume that they will be just starting up meeting every two weeks again, um, but they're still discussing. Okay, is there any comment or question at this time? All right, then we're going to, we've already approved the minutes, so we're moving on to the town manager's report. Paul. Thank you, Lynn. Um, <clears throat> so a few things. One is I want to uh, give credit to our acting town clerk for getting a $34,000 grant to help make sure that um, our poll workers are safe and that we can do make improvements into our polling locations and um, you know, we were, and so I just heard, um, in, in, a, in her, her initiative was really appreciated. And, uh, if she put in the grant, we got a word on it right away. So it's really, that was really an exciting thing. It's her first grant too. So she was very proud of that, which is really good. Uh, along the same lines this week, she, um, she's, uh, conducting, uh, poll worker trainings. And so these are things that are going on. So, uh, an opportunity to, um, after listening to the wardens to actually do the training on the, on the poll workers. Um, we'll be, we are preparing to bring to the council <coughs> um, a, a sort of a revised, um, narrowed down um, uh, design for the North Common to see if it, it's something that the council would like to uh, take on a, as a project. The money has already been appropriated for the most part. Um, when this last came up, this it came up with the select board was still in office and the select board said, this is not for us to decide. It's really up for the council to make a decision. Um, and so it's, it's sort of had some time and now under COVID and we understand what our financial situation is. The project got was, was um, the way it was designed was too much for what our funding was. So we're looking at narrowing it down um, but still think it's really important to move forward on. So this will be the first time the council will get to look at it. So um, this, that's coming up in the next uh, meeting or one after that. I forget which one it is, but uh, we're working on that for the council. I assume you'll want to take some time to think about it. Um, that'd be on your schedule. Um, I want to mention on um, uh, Craig's doors is making really good progress on securing uh, places for people to uh, be housed uh, during the uh, winter months, um, starting November 1st. Uh, I can't really talk about exactly where they are at this moment in time, but it, it, we have some really positive um, developments happening on that. Um, they have not inked any deals or anything like that, so that's why I can't really talk about that. Um, but I can just assure you that if, if everything works out, it'll be a really good solution for the town. Um, and we're also considering uh, day space in the in the winter. I mentioned this before. That's something that we're actively pursuing uh, at various locations throughout the town, and hope to be able to come up with something that will serve uh, the people who need it the most. Um, along those same lines, we are looking at a number of things um, that will involve the council of um, things that might go in the public way. Um, we're again using some CARES money to be looking at things that we can do to improve the town, both during the COVID pandemic, but also longer term. So one of these things are, are these little stations that are solar powered that provide um, uh, electrical outlets for folks. So there's so many people who depend on their phones for their to, to live by. So we'd like to put these near park benches and things like that where people can plug in their, their phones and get, get it charged up, especially during the pandemic. It's much harder to find outlets to, to charge your phones. Um, especially if you don't have a home. Um, but if you're just traveling or anything, it's, it's important. Um, we're looking at some signage downtown, some electronic signage that um, 
would help convey what's going on in town for people who aren't on Twitter or whatever, or aren't, don't come to the town's website and looking at some options with that. Um, and we're also looking at restrooms if we can, um, to, because we know that, that there's a definite need for restrooms throughout the, you know, throughout the community. These are all ideas, whether we could actually pull them off um, is a big question, whether they will be permitted to be um, funded through the CARES Act or not is another question as well. But it's, those are the types of things that we're working on. Just wanted to give you an update on that. Okay, are there questions and or discussion? Darcy, you have your hand up. Yeah, I have um, a question about, I have a constituent who applied to be on the Community Safety Committee and she applied through the, the form the, it's a, like a community activity form, but it's modified for this, specifically for this committee. Um, and she said that, and she's been very good about like uh, emailing and making sure that everybody knows that she has made an application. Um, anyway, she, her, her form didn't go through. Um, and the staff called her and then got information from her, you know, just by asking, orally asking her the questions over the phone. I just am a little worried about other people who aren't as, you know, like if they didn't write an email saying, by the way, this is the cover letter for my application. How will you know who has applied if, if they're not going through. Well, I don't know what the issue was on that one. I know um, she did email and say, did you get it? And we didn't. Um, so we have gotten others. Other, It's working for other, other people. So uh, that's why I had uh, Angela call and say, can you help her get through if it's not, you know, how, how can we help her if it's not going through the normal channels? But, uh -huh. you know, I, I'm, I mean, we'll test it tomorrow, but, you know, we have received other people applying. So if you hear other people that's not that individual, it's, it might be something, a more systemic issue, then we need to jump on that. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Dorothy, you have your hand up? Yes. Um, Paul, I want to ask some questions about public restroom. Sure. Um, you mentioned possibly at uh, Plum Brook Kiwanis Park, and I'm trying to figure out where is that? Uh, Plum Brook is on Potline. Uh, Kiwanis Park is on Stanley. And okay. So, but I, you know, when we were talking about Kendrick Park Playground, mm -hmm. uh, we had quite uh, in many of the meetings, and we talked about the need of a restroom there. It's a, it a tra it's in the middle. It's like a traffic island with road traffic all around it. So, crossing the street with small kids and walking quite the distance to, I think there was a restroom you said at the high school, which probably does not exist now, uh, for the public. Um, and, and part of the cost was one of the issues. And um, Kathy sent me a um, thing on, on a, a public restroom, which is very successful someplace else, which is self-cleaning, safe, and whatever. And it was very, very expensive. Okay. And so I know cost was a big issue. So that now that we have the possibility of using COVID money, I would think that the place to put one of these uh, public restrooms would be at Kendrick Park since this was brought up by many people in the various uh, meetings and forums on that. Um, because it's to do a good safe one that's not gonna be a, a, a nuisance and a problem is expensive. Um, is there any possibility or if you've been thinking about that? Yeah, so we've looked at, you know, we're looking at different locations downtown. There's a need downtown for sure. Locating one downtown that looks nice is really a big challenge. The ones in the parks can look sort of like they're, um, they can look like a park, um, if you see it at a national park or something, they, they don't, but downtown, I think people will really care what, what, a, what a restroom looks sure. like. Um, so finding the right location for it and finding the, you know, a lot of these things, when they come off the shelf, they're not exactly what you want to see. Um, so I think, you know, Steve has, Steve Schreiber has sent some examples of things that do work. Um, but again, some of these things are very, um, uh, either innovative and look very in, or, or they're very expensive that way too. Expensive. Yeah. But maybe good. And there are other requirements, you know, you have to have water, you have to have sewer, you have to have all, all these things available to it. 
Cindy Jo, you have your hand up. I just wanted to say yay on finding ways to use the COVID money that can improve the town for more than just during the COVID. So I like the idea of kiosks. Um, I love the idea of public restrooms. Um, so hopefully we can get approval to do that and, and it'll work out. George, you have your hand up. Yeah, Paul, I'd, I had been working under the assumption that the council would need to make a decision on the uh, MBLC grant um, by December, but um, from your report, it's clearly not the case. Um, is that something that happened recently and I just missed it, or is um, which is perfectly possible? Um, but my understanding now is they've pushed the awards off for a year. Well, the awards are until next June, uh, the way I understand it. And Lynn, Lynn has been closer to this than I am. Okay. Let me, let me um, provide an update. What the MBLC decided to do this year, because they were concerned that the new towns that they might offer money to wouldn't be able to take it because of fiscal issues. What they did was they decided to go ahead and give money those towns that had already started their projects but were on the list and so that is what they've done with their money so while we were in the queue uh, for this year meaning fy 21 in fact we will not be in the queue until next year unless they make a different decision then so the earliest we'll start hearing in the spring of fy 21 as to what their intentions will be and the earliest that they would actually make an award that would be official would be July 1st, 2021. So for the moment, this is not something that's going to be on our agenda. No, but I, I think we will probably see the need to start discussing it in the spring. Shalini, you have your hand up. Yes. Do we have a cutoff date for the community safety committee's applications for interview? Well, um, look, we'll be after tonight. We'll be targeting on October twenty second because that's when it's on the agenda. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Alyssa. Um, I'm sorry, just quickly following up on the restroom issue. So I don't pretend to understand what this particular grant program is looking for in terms of using CARES money for restrooms at Kiwanis or at Plum Brook, but I don't have any understanding of why any rational funding agency would think that was a better choice than something downtown. I realize it would be easier and I realize that a lot of kids and adults play on those fields when we're not having a pandemic, but we have people downtown now who need restrooms that don't have them. And so I would much rather we were spending our limited time and resources on figuring out a way to include a restroom at Kendrick than in figuring out a way to put a cute little block house with a cute little roof on it at Kiwanis or elsewhere, just because we have CARES money to do that. Again, following up on what Dorothy said and also following up regularly on the need that's been expressed when we talk about the fact that public buildings aren't open for people to be able to use a restroom facility. That seems like a huge win for us to be able to do something downtown. And I also see it as far more important than making progress on the North Common. I realize the money has been set aside. Steve and I are gonna have a huge argument about this when the time comes, because we were both at the same public meetings where a bunch of people said, oh, this could be so cool. And the select board said, you know what? This is not as simple as it looks. And we are divided just among a select board and we are not gonna to touch this. So yes, we're dumping that over to the town council. And so Steve and I can fight about that for hours when it comes back to the town council. But again, we I'm have limited time. Terms. So I don't want to talk about North Common. I don't want to talk about restrooms at Kiwanis or Potwin. I want to talk about a restroom downtown that will actually help people now and in the future, like the information kiosks, like the chargers will. I just think that's a way better deployment of our resources. I can, it, it's not an either or situation. We hope to be able to do everything. Melanie, you have your hand up. 
Yeah, I just want to follow up also about um, making our meetings um, accessible to people with disabilities. And one conversation we've been having is about trying to get uh, author for transcribing our meetings on Zoom. However, I've spoken with uh, at least three different people with disabilities and they have um, state, shared that that's not a good enough um, translation mechanism because there's a lot of emotion and everything that um, a, a person is able to do, but it's not captured in that. And so maybe that's something we need to have a discussion as a council or um, just how do we send out the message and communicate to people and accommodate and make that a priority. So, so honor just so people know is that it's um, our meetings are transcribed after the fact when they go up on YouTube. So you can read the closed caption after the fact. It's not done in real time. If someone wants to participate in real time, there isn't a, a closed caption feature. Although that might that I think that's that's changing. You know, Zoom keeps improving, and improving, and Otter is a, is a um, third party thing that does real time closed captioning. I have not seen it in action, but it's the thing that seems to be being recommended by people. Um, and so we were looking for a technological solution to making our meetings more accessible to people, much like TV, Amherst Media, everybody does with, or whoever uh, with, with closed captioning. If you are talking about American Sign Language interpretation, which I think some people are asking for, that's would require, there would be a significant um, investment and, and significant um, commitment from the town to say we want it and you would have to choose which meetings you want and if you want just to council meetings it's about several hundred dollars per meeting to hire someone to come in and do asl um it's so just a budgetary decision uh, i think would be a great thing to do um there are people out there who do this um, especially in zoom it makes it super easy because people can often do it from home you usually have to hire two um, ASL interpreters because they, you know, it's a very intensive job, so you need to trade off. And, um, and so, but we have, when we try to do it, it, it takes, it's about, it can, it can cost several hundred dollars per meeting. Dorothy, you have your hand up. Um, at Holyoke Community College, they have just started a contract with Kaltura. And Kaltura, is you you bring your video in through Kaltura and they will do um, machine translating right away. If you say, no, I want to have human uh, captioning, you ask for that and there's a, a delay, um, maybe of a day. Um, there's been a lot of this going on, so maybe a two days at the most. Um, that is something that's out there. So if you, you could have your tech people look into it and see if that has any possibilities for what you have, what you need. Can I just follow up? Yes, yeah, Shalini. Yeah, I spoke with somebody who has functional blindness and she was just saying that there are different ways to communicate and it, some of them were not involving costs, but more in the sense of like the way we write our, um, uh, when we send out our emails or even the meetings, the way they're posted, if we can just say that we're, you know, just acknowledging that maybe like as of now we are putting order to make it accessible but we welcome your feedback or just like sort of letting them know that they're being acknowledged and they're being welcomed or if they're out in person i mean we don't have in-person meetings but she was just saying an example like if the flyer mentioned we're so sorry we were not able to make this place um, wheelchair accessible, then the people at least know that and they don't have to make a call and they don't have, but they know that they were thought about in the process. So there are just ways to make people feel, you know, know that we are thinking about them and we are, you know, we're trying to work through this. So that's one thing. And then the second thing is like, as a town comes, I mean, you raised the question that this is something we need to figure out as a town. But I didn't hear from the council whether this is something we are going to discuss as part of an agenda or where and when will it be discussed. Thank you. And I, I put it on my list, uh, but Paul, do you want to have a comment? 
Just on the first one, yeah. No, I think the points you're making are really important. Um, and there's, um, you know, we do we do have an ADA transition plan. We've had there's been a consulting firm that's looking at all of our buildings and things that are out there. And that, you know, I, I I know that's come in as a first draft, um, which I've not really studied it yet. Um, and on the second point, our communications manager is looking at our website, and a lot of it is not just functional things on the website, it's how we do things. And you mm. know, Alyssa will, this will resonate with Alyssa because we often will put pictures up on the website instead of documents that a machine can read for people, things like that. And we have mm -hmm. to retrain our staff to be able to do things that make mistakes that I do, which is take mm -hmm. pictures of a PDF as opposed to having something that can be read by machines. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, you know, she's identified that as we redo our website, we're trying to make it a friendly, not just um, for, ADA purposes, but also mobile first, because most people access our website through their phones. So, um, so those things are, are all, you know, being worked on. Uh, um, but I think, you know, and, and these, and this is something, you know, doing the, the, you know, just taking in consideration when you're redoing your website, make it accessible, just like you do with any other building. So that's what we're, that's our intention. Thank you. Darcy, you yeah, I just wanted to bring up um, the public comment that was made today uh, that was sent to the town council by Laura Drucker. Um, I have a, a couple of things to say about it. One is, um, or a couple of questions for the town manager. One is, do you envision that the Part of the eighty thousand dollars that's being set aside for the community safety process, and then include the courses that you want guests to access. This video explains the admin settings for guest access. Do you do you think that some of that money could be set aside for stipends for? People who otherwise might not be able to participate in the process. Make sure that guest mm -hmm. access. So somebody needs to mute. It's available in your courses. <laughs> um, so that's one question: is could could that that those funds be used um, to pay a stipend to people who, you know, would could really contribute to the process but wouldn't otherwise be able to do it because they just can't afford it. And secondly, um, you know, from the very beginning, we have talked about um, preserving our public comment that comes in in writing and putting it somewhere so that it's archived so that the public can see the written public comments that come in by email. And so those, the, I, I have those two questions of like, can we get a system going to preserve our public comments? Um, and can we use funds for stipends? So on the stipend front, we, we have not done paid people to serve on committees other than the council and school committee. So that would be a new thing. And I think it would have, we would, if the, if the town decided to do that, we'd want to look at the broader implications and why this committee, not another committee. Um, you know, and I, but I understand the need and the um, and how people take on expenses. Um, that being said, there's there, you know, so I, it's something to consider. But we don't have a policy for doing that, and we don't know what the ramifications and why would you choose this committee versus, you know, a different you know, agricultural committee or something. It's like we want to make sure that. Um, we're fair about it, you know, but I, you know, I, we don't want to exclude folks from serving either. So, um, I don't have a good answer for you on that other than just, we've never done it before, which is not a great answer. That was a huge issue and point made by the Black Lives Matter people who came to our meetings repeatedly. Um, so, and the other issue about somehow I don't try to assert the other issue. I'm, and I, we all received Laura's comment. The question is whether or not every email we receive is public comment. And, and so there have been from time to time that we have assembled 
around a certain topic, uh, comments that we receive by email. What we have not done is consistently gathered emails like we received today that said, if I could be a public comment, I would make this comment. And um, I think we need to come up with a um, way in which we differentiate because um, the issue of publishing all emails, though they are a matter of public record, is a whole lot different than publishing what somebody might be giving us because it was meant to be public comment. I think it requires a much bigger discussion. Uh, well, I would like us to have it. Okay. Yes, I'm hearing you. Andy? Yeah, and as we uh, explore that question, I think we have to get back to the point that We've had a longstanding policy in the council and the select board had a longstanding policy that it's not appropriate to respond to public comment because it raises something to an agenda item for if it gets discussed by the body that was not published as an agenda item. And uh, therefore we don't, um, we don't take a public comment that we hear early in a meeting and discuss it during the meeting itself. And uh, so I, I'm a little bit uncomfortable with saying that somebody sends an email saying, I wanted to make this as a public comment, but I'm not gonna be able to be there. And then we have a different uh, approach to that than we would to a public comment that was offered during public comment period. Right. I think that's a different, I think that's a much more in-depth agenda item for a future discussion. Um, so are there any other comments on the town manager's report at this time? Dorothy? I had marked down things that I wanted to follow up on. One was, um, providing some kind of child care for town staff. Um, and I think that's a great idea. Um, I think the town staff uh, probably works hard all the time, but it's certainly been working extraordinarily hard um, since the town council started um, and then double hard uh, under, under COVID. Um, what are some of the thoughts that you have for how you would do that? So LSSC is examining that. Uh, the school department is working working with the school department. They're looking at their three after school programs that have, that are offering that are that are not working now because they're not uh, so repurposing the people who used to do that work, um, and again using some care funds to be able to offer um, child care um, during the day uh, for people who otherwise might not have child care. Um, if we have the capacity and the interest, we'd like, love to be able to open that up to the entire community because it's not just town employees who need, need help. It's a lot of people who need help. Um, the, we're looking at uh, the middle school as being a location for that. Um, we also have looked at the bank center as a potential location for that. Uh, it's something that LSC has, has been working very closely, looking at very working very hard on and looking at the state guidelines. The governor has a, a Left, uh, made the guidance a little bit easier to comply with for able to, to be able to provide that kind of service. So yes, we're looking at that very actively. Okay. Um, maybe Joe, you have your hand up. Yeah, I hear the middle school mentioned for something like that and the mother and me of a middle schooler starts freaking out. Um, I've got a student who really wants to go to school. So I would encourage and highly recommend that whatever happens does not affect how many students in the middle school can attend middle school in person when we finally get to be able to go in person. Because having a childcare program that the middle school parents would then have to say to their children, oh, you can't go two days a week or one day a week anymore because we're offering childcare to so-and-so would be yet another devastating blow to that. So I assume you're not going to compromise any of that and that Mike would never do that, but I'm going to put a, 
plug out there to make sure that it does not get compromised. No, no the, the superintendent would have to make the decision where it would be located. And clearly he knows the interest of educating our students is top priority. Melissa. I'm sorry, a brief item for a possible future discussion and maybe it makes more sense for it to be at CRC rather than at full town council, but I'm still not sure that it, if it falls under CRC. One of the things the town manager mentioned in his report is he said, I am reviewing the request to delay slash decrease fees for liquor license holders. License fees are due November 1st. And so we have a board of license commissioners. They work with the town manager, town staff, and we've talked a lot about how to support local businesses. And so it feels a little weird that town council is completely disconnected from that, given that we talk a good game about supporting local businesses. And so, you know, we have a time frame coming right up. And so decisions are just going to have to be made. But I feel like it's something that as we're continuing to sort out the role of town council, town council committees, and the very strong executive authority we have in the charter, and now the separate board of license commissioners, um, where it is that that information gets fed in so that our community, we're representing them when it comes to this sort of topic. So again, town managers just gonna have to probably go ahead and make a decision because renewals are due November 1st, but it feels like something that some town committee, probably not TSO, even though it's a way town services, perhaps CRC because of its focus on economic development is the kind of place where it feels like it should have a stopping off point at some point in the process, but yet as always without slowing things down. Thank you. I was just thinking of something very nice I wanted to share uh, at the end at, at our meeting uh, of a wonderful experience I had walking on the Silvio Conte uh, path, which I'd never been on before, which is down by Muddy Bridge. And it's completely handicapped accessible, raised wooden walkway. Um, and um, there were also some families with children on it. And that immediately made my mind jump to um, maybe the town can put together a pamphlet of activities such as that, um, using the resources in the town that are particularly suitable for parents who happen to be homeschooling, taking care of their kids, or whatever it is, you know, like whatever combo you call it um, uh, at this time. Um, I think that, you know, you've got the people and the staff that could put that together very quickly. Andy? Yeah, just, uh Getting back to Paul quickly on the question of liquor licenses, do was my under, is it am I correct that that um, would be made up by CARES Act money, or would that be a loss of revenue for the town if we relinquished some fees? I, I think it's not able to be make, made up by CARES Act at this point. We can't use CARES Act. We've been requesting that to be able to um, replace lost revenue with CARES Act fund, funds. They have not allowed us to do that. And we were, that's, we've been holding on, I mean, every city in town has been hoping that that's what the federal legislature would allow us to do, but they have not. So it would be a uh, reduction in revenue. Mm -hmm. Yes, it would be. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, can I just, this kind of meshes into the agenda item called town council comments. And I think what's really nice is we've actually had some time to have some comments tonight among us. Uh, and I appreciate that. Uh, on my list now of future agenda items, I have added sponsors. Can they vote on items they sponsor when they're in their committees? Another agenda item that's been out there for a while is liaisons, and this has come up over particularly the Amherst Housing Trust. Uh, third one is TAC, and what TAC has done is raised the question of, does every committee in the town understand their relationship to the council? Do we know what their relationship is to the council? And should there be a discussion about that? Um, another one that's on my mind is we've learned some things um, during this period of COVID, particularly because of the use of technology. At some point, we will transition back to the town room. And what are the lessons we need to take with us? For example, 
I wonder if we need to provide a way that people can make public comment, but not have to be in the room, which more people have been able to make public comment and still go on and take care of their kids. So at some point I want us to discuss what have we learned and what do we want to change? Uh, another one is the accessibility question, which was brought up by Shalini. Another was the issue of stipends for committees that's been brought up, particularly as it relates to public safety. Uh, another one has been the whole issue of public comment and what constitutes written versus whatever. And then the other thing, I just want to mention two things uh, that are in the charter that I need to mention. And that is the following executive minutes were approved and released during the town council executive session on September 21st, 2020. They are of executive committee June 17th, 2019, August 26th, 2019, September 23rd, 2019, August 31, 2020. The minutes of August 19, 2019 were approved and retained for future town council review and release. All approved and released executive session minutes are available at www.amherstma.gov slash town council. The other thing I wanna mention is that I have automatically referred the um, East West Rail Resolution to GOL um, that came as a request to us. I chose to sponsor the resolution and then we have uh, worked on it and it's now at GOL. So I think those are the main things I needed to mention to you as president. Are there other counselor comments and future agenda items? Do we have any Dorothy? Um, a future agenda item. Uh, a lot of work has to go uh, through before it's ready, is the question of having the whole town go with their own uh, broadband system. Uh, many towns in this area are doing it. And as I've mentioned a couple of times, that would be certainly related to social equity um, because there's just many, many things that would have to be worked out, but buildings would be wired uh, as part of this process and all the houses would be wired. The town would then have to figure out the fee structure. Um, and then perhaps the people who owned apartment buildings would be the ones who would pay the fee, um, at least in some areas. So it's, it's a big topic, but it's related to uh, the fact that we have people, many people in the same house or apartment trying to go to school, go to work and do all of those things, all of them on the internet, and uh, we're not equal in this way. Um, in my house, we can have three people working. In other houses, you can't. And some people don't have any connectivity at all. And that is very uh, unfair. We can't have a fair town until we get this straightened out. So this is a topic that I would um, like to have uh, worked up. And if anyone who's interested in working on it um, with me, I would love to hear from you. And Lynn will tell us where it goes. Right. Darcy? Yeah, I, w I have the issue that I brought up at the last meeting I attended, which is that I think we need to talk about um, when we, we would talk about when we should talk about uh, raising our salaries so yeah. that so that this job is accessible to a wider range of people. And number two, I was glad to see that CRC uh, brought up an issue that I was wanted to bring up and they brought it up on their own, which is um, looking at, um, re-looking at the process for appointing um, members of the planning board, which was in their report. And um, so I'm interested to see what the next step is with that. Thank you. And Shalini. Um, I don't know if this is the appropriate place or time to not share it, but I had sent, um, okay. I'd spoken to, to a few people of color in our community and they had 
um, raised the question of renaming some of our streets locally uh, on the ba uh, based on uh, some of the black leaders in our community. And for example, Baker Street or so naming it after some of the local heroes who were and sheroes who were black. And um, if that's something the town council should do, because I feel like, you know, in this time of despair, that might be something that is doable and it might create, um, you know, have some positive impact. Julius Lester. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're not going to get into debates or taking these topics up. We have to be on an agenda. Mm -hmm. are, are there any other comments at this time? So that is councillor comments and also future agenda items. And we have taken care of the item that was 48 hours, which was the resolution. There's no executive session. And Andy, I want you to note, we are adjourning at 943. <laughs> Have a nice evening. Yay, good night, everyone. Acknowledged. <laughs>